Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Uh, first of all, apologies if you were tuning in this time last week. Um, I had to be called away onto a family matter. Uh, everyone is well and all is good, so uh, no worries there. Uh, but uh, I'm back uh, on time again this week. So uh, we're going to do the subject that I was hoping to cover last week. And uh, I've got, as always, I've got a whole load of questions from my patrons that I'm going to be working through. The subject this time is the Stormlands. Uh, we've been moving our way through uh, the, the continent of Westeros, and we've now worked our way pretty much all the way through, right down to sort of the bottom right hand corner really and the stormlands as an area it's one of the smaller areas of westeros and as a as, as a region it's quite varied it's, there's a sort of a mountainous ish regions there's uh, down because it borders with dawn with the red mountains in the south there's a huge sort of hilly land which uh, covers which is called the Dornish Marches, which stretches across to the west. There's lots of very lush, verdant forests, like the uh, the rainforest and the um, uh, the King's Forest. The and there's obviously the land along the coast, which is where the Stormlands get their name from. That part of the world, there are lots of storms, and uh, the Kingswood. I should have said earlier, uh, not the King's Forest. There's lots of storms around there, which is where this land gets its name from. Um, I'll get into a little bit of a history uh, in the moment, and I'll get into uh, some of the characters uh, as well. Uh, but just wanted to do a few quick thank yous. Uh, Ryan Larkin, thank you so much, uh, and Sylvia Galasso. Thank Thank you for the uh, super stickers before we went live. I hugely appreciate that. Uh, De Crow, uh last week, um, unfortunately, just before I had to postpone, uh, saying, thank you so much for keeping me company as I deliver food in the Pacific Northwest. I can't overstate how much your excellent content helps. Well, I'm delighted that I am able to uh, to help in uh, some small way. Cindy from Cindy's, thank you so much for the uh, super sticker. Um, uh, uh, Cyclops is better than Wolverine. Um, good name, I'm not sure I'd agree with it to be honest. But, uh, uh quick question Davos is a lord, but does he have any men at arms? Um, yeah, when he's uh, basically he's a landed knight, um, yes, technically a lord. Uh, so does he have many men, any men at arms? Not really. The thing is with Davos was because he was uh, only recently made. Um, sort of brought up into the nobility, uh, then uh, he was given a little patch of land and his the, the idea was that he would then stay most of the time or as much as possible with Stannis. So he doesn't really, didn't really have time to sort of uh, develop this into something that um, can, uh, he can have a whole series of uh, other knights working to him and things like that, which he could. Any any knight can make another knight, so uh, he could definitely have done that. But th there's no indication that he has got a huge amount, sort of his own mini army to call on. Um, Mara Lee saying, uh, "Just a show of love and support for all the fabulous content, merch, and great stories. You are so appreciated. Thank you. Love to gorgeous Dan the dog. That's my dog. Who is again? He's taken himself off to bed. Uh, thank you, Mara. You know how much I appreciate your support. Uh, and Lady Gordon, very generous. Thank you so much. Just before we went on air, saying I put a question over on Patreon, which I got. Thank you. I will pick up and answer that one in a bit. Uh, but also just remembered, wanted to ask you this one: Will Brienne execute Stannis like in the show? And if not, not how will she avenge Renly and how will Stannis die in the books? Uh, okay, well, we uh, let, let's kick off with this one. Um, will uh, Will Brienne kill Stannis like or in the books, like on the show? No, uh, Brienne at the moment is in the Riverlands and she is going to be there for a little while. Her plot is tied up now with the Brotherhood Without Banners. I think that she will head to the north with Jamie, probably at the end of the Winds of Winter. Uh, but at the moment, she is hundreds and hundreds of miles away from where Stannis is. So I don't think we're going to see. She certainly won't. In On the show, it was after the upcoming battle outside Winterfell. Um, that she then executed him. She's not in the same place in the book. So that is not going to happen. Um, how will she get revenge for Renly? Well, 
I think there is an outside chance that she may end up um, executing Stannis in some way right at, you know, if Stannis survives all the way through to the beginning of A Dream of Spring or something like that, then perhaps. But I actually, I don't think that she will. I don't think that is for her. And I think that the whole point is that she is not a character who actually does revenge. This is this is one of those rare things, one of those rare characters within this world that George L. Martin has created, that she is not driven. Yes, she thinks that Renly, and she witnessed the fact that Renly was, was murdered um, and knows Stannis was behind it somehow, but um, she is she is going to do her duty and she is not there out for revenge in the way that a lot of other characters are. So I don't think that is her arc in the books, to be honest. Uh, but what will happen to Stannis? I think that's one of the, the, the things that George R. R. Martin has left most open. Um, he, for the Winds of Winter, um, he's not going to die in the battle I'm pretty sure the battle which is coming up, he's, his army is uh, out in this crofter's village and an army of Freys and uh, Mandalays are coming out to meet him. Uh, he's not going to die in that battle, I'm pretty sure. The Mandalays are going to turn on the Freys and uh, then he and the Mandalays will head to try and capture Winterfell. So I think that is what's going to be happening there. Um, the winter is still going to be an issue. And I think that Melisandre's killing of Shireen um, in order to um, free them from the weather is going to make a whole lot more sense in the books. I think that that's going to be very clear and that will literally allow Stannis not to freeze to death. But what happens after, as I suspect he will, he reclaims Winterfell. Well, uh, he could go a number of different ways with this, but his duty, sense of duty, is still about, and the whole point of what he was trying to do was about installing the Starks back into Winterfell so that all of the North Valley's behind them and then focus looking north to the threat from the others. And that is very much what his, um, his uh, focus is going to be. The one thing that I, and I don't want to put too much weight on it, but it has to mean something, is that Danny, when she was in the House of the Undying, she had a whole load of visions. Now, we shouldn't believe all of the visions, but that a lot of them seemed very, very accurate. And one of them connected with this idea of Slayer of Lies. She is going to reveal falsehoods. Clearly, one of these is Fagon's identity, uh, the Mama's Dragon and all the rest of it. But she also saw a king uh, with blue eyes who cast no shadow. Now, it, that could be the leader of the others if they have a sort of a Night King equivalent, but it also could well be Stannis um, because he has got blue eyes and he is not who he says he is. He is not Azora High Reborn and she will. somebody has to slay that lie and Daenerys could well be the one. So it's possible that uh, that he survives all the way through to the beginning ish of uh, Dream of Spring, and then Danny has a role in his downfall. I don't think, and and Brienne may be involved in that, but I don't think this is a Brienne revenge mission. And I think that it's entirely possible this is going to be associated with revealing the fact that he is not Azora High reborn. Um, okay, so let's get into some questions from um, my patrons. Uh, I've got a few to start with, just as almost all well, the background, the history of uh, the uh, Stormlands as a whole. First of all, Wolf Wilson saying, any thoughts on the actual origins of Storm's End? The perfectly connected stones do somewhat put me in mind of the Valyrian architecture perhaps a proto-version, question mark? Could there be a connection with the legendary dragons from Westeros? Urax, Davos the Dragon Slayer, Dragons of Battle Island. Um, well, the Storm's End is, is a bit of a mystery. It's one of these ancient castles that does seem to come from 
uh, well, the Age of Heroes, and it's it's not at all in any way falling down. It's stay, staying strong. It has never been um, successfully attacked, besieged in any way, and it is quite epically robust. It's it's got this one circular. Uh, outer wall, wall, curtain wall, which is 100 feet high. It's its thickest. It's 80 feet thick. And it's made from stone, uh, two layers of stone with sort of uh, shingle and cementy kind of stuff in the middle. Uh, and the, the layers of stone are put together so tightly you cannot see the cracks. Now, yes, in a way, I completely understand that is reminiscent of the kind of the Valyrian style of fused stone, but that fused stone seems to be, uh, first of all, black, and secondly, it seems to be completely smooth, uh, as in you can't see any join at all, whereas, uh, so you don't know where one stone ended and another began, whereas on Storm's End, the clear implications you can see there are different stones in there, it's just that the masonry is so good uh, that that the, the 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 wind cannot get into any cracks, so there does seem to be a bit of a difference. The legend of it, uh, it's a good little legend. There was um, this guy called Durham Godsgrief, who was one of the first men, and he married the daughter of the uh, the storm god the water god um whose name was elenai and he the, the the storm god was horrified at this and that the wedding he destroyed all of Duran's family um and every time Duran tried to build a castle then it just got blown down and destroyed and this final time he did it um, he managed to build this one that stood with some magical aid, and there's lots of different stories. Perhaps it was the children of the forest. Perhaps a boy advised him, a boy who would grow up to become Bran the Builder. So there's uh, the and magic, magic was woven into the walls. We're told. So there's a there's a really good sort of set of stories around that. Um, it's one of those things that. Um, I don't. I don't think we're ever going to know. George R. R. Martin's not going to give us the exact details of, of what happened there. He it it is, however, set up as being one of these clear things that is um, uh, back from that connection that we have got between the Wall, Winterfell, uh, the High Tower, and Storm's End. All these things linked in with Bran the Builder. So we're being told to make the connection in our minds with that kind of. Uh, Battle for the Dawn, Age of Heroes, Bran the Builder, Children of the Forest kind of feel. There is something going on there. We're just never told exactly what it is. Um, connected to this, Sydney Rose says, Hey, Robert and Dashing Dan, I find it fascinating that the Stormlands, particularly Storm's End, is packed full with so much lore dating back to the Dawn Age but many Stormlanders still converted to the faith of the Seven. Were the Northerners simply more attached to the old gods than the Stormlanders, or did their relative isolation from the rest of the continent allow them to better preserve their fate? Um, yeah, I think that the, the latter is probably more true. The, the area around the... Stormlands was originally the first men had it, and they were, in, in fact, one of the few bits of detail we get about this war between the first men and the children forest comes from the Stormlands, and we're told that Durn God's Grief tried to take the, the Rainwood, and a woods witch held it for a generation for the children of forest who were there, and we're told that that was... Um, a long battle for that part of the of, of Westeros. We're not really told of the details of battles elsewhere, but there we're told that there was one. Um, so clearly, the first men were strong there. The 
the reason why in the north, and it has to be said just before I move on, there are still weirwoods down in the Stormlands. Unlike when you go to Dawn there, we can't really hear of any. If you go across to the Westlands, yes, there's a couple, but there's not much that you hear about. In the Stormlands, there definitely still are weirwoods. There's some in the Rainwood. There's one in Storm's End. There are a lot of them about still. Um, but the North managed to survive staying worshipping the old gods because of geography. There are only two real ways into the North if you've got an, an army. One of them is, is um, up what became the King's Road, but wasn't the King's Road at that point, so it wasn't as big or impressive a road, and you had to get through Moat Kalin, which was very hard. And the other is um, basically up the White Knife River, what we now call White Harbour. Both of them are very hard to deal with, uh, to get through, because you've got Moat Kalin and White Harbour is also defended. The stocks made sure that was defended. They put the Mandalays in there to protect them. So the North could hold out. The Stormlands couldn't. The Andals, this wasn't just a one-off invasion, a big army. This was literally over centuries, waves and waves and waves of Andals just coming in. And eventually, the, the Stormlanders, like... All, pretty much all the other parts of mainland Westeros just accepted it, just married into them and, and allowed it to happen. So for me, the question isn't why is it that the, the North kept hold of their uh, faith, whereas the Stormlanders didn't. I think I understand that bit. It's the why is it that the Weirwoods still hold there? in a way that they don't, despite the fact that people stopped worshipping them, in a way that they don't in other parts of the Seven Kingdoms. That, for me, is uh, is a fascinating moment, uh, question. Uh, Brian Morris, thank you very much, saying, um, this doesn't really have anything to do with tonight's topic, but in the past you said Jon Snow is the Frodo character, not Aragorn. Who, in your opinion, is the Aragorn character in the story? Uh, oh, good question. So. Um, what I've said to be clear is that George R. R. Martin is writing Jon Snow like he's the Aragorn character, the the long promised king, the hero who's going to um, save the world and all the rest of it, and at the end he's going to sit on the throne. That is the way that he's writing him. He is <clears throat> meeting every single fantasy. If you've read as much high fantasy as I have, you know these tropes. He's the orphan who doesn't know who his parents are. There are prophecies about him. He he grows up not uh, and, and leaves his home in his teenage years and goes out on these uh, adventures. He has this mystical character who's who is uh, guiding his ways even without him realizing it. All of these things are just sort of like woven in to create this tapestry of what we would expect the stereotypical um, prince who was promised character to be like that's what he's writing him like but he will end up being the frodo character this is the, my view uh, the frodo character being the person who carries the heavy burden and does what he has to do but at the end of it even though he played perhaps the biggest role in saving the world, he he cannot enjoy it once it has happened. He he's the world is then lost to him. He is broken by it, and he has to then leave this world at the end of it. This world he saved. So I that is what I've said is that I think that George R. R. Martin is writing Jon Snow like Aragorn, but he is actually Frodo. Now. You ask who is the Aragorn figure in here. I don't think there is. I don't think George R. R. Martin is right. He's not rewriting The Lord of the Rings. Um, so I don't think he has this character. I think that the the whole the subversion thing, I, I try not to talk too much about George R. R. Martin subverting tropes because people talked about that a huge amount a while ago and I, I felt it kind of missed the point. I don't think he is there just about subverting tropes. I don't think that's what his uh, his mindset is. Um, but I think in this he is. I think uh, he is creating this character who meets all of these criteria but then isn't that character that we think 
he's going to be. So there isn't going to be an Aragorn character, is what I'm uh, sort of saying. Uh, Jay Mc. Donald, uh, thank you so much. Uh, McDonald, sorry. Uh, thank you so much for the super chat. Saying hi, Robert. New to the channel and loving the content. Uh, good, welcome. Uh, when Hardhome was destroyed hundreds of years ago, what else was happening around that time period? Is it possible the children of the forest were involved in the attack? Um, I'd have to go back, and there's there's always one of these things where I say, oh, I'll have to come back to you on the detail of, of that. I, I can't think of anything specific that was happening at the exact time. Um, for those who don't know, Hard Home was the closest thing there was to a wildling city or, uh, or a township, as it were. It was a port. Um, and then it blew up. <laughs> it just, that's, but we don't know exactly what happened. Uh, there was this huge uh, fire explosion, plumes of smoke. This could be seen for hundreds of miles around. This is how people uh, from the south knew what had happened. Um, and it's an unexplained mystery, to be honest. Now, um, could the children of the forest have had anything to do with it? I, I struggle to think of a motivation for them that and it's not really their style is is what i would probably say to that um so children of the forest aren't really fire people um that's not their weapon they hate fire fire burns down trees they don't like it so that's not really it doesn't doesn't seem like them and what would they gain from blowing up hard home hard home at the time yes there were like lots of sort of rumors about it and all the rest of it but that's mostly people from south of the war spreading rumors about it there was a maester who went up we read, read about him in uh, the world of ice and fire and he went up and he spent some time there and he was learning about it and you know it wasn't all horrible it, it was just a different culture um so why would the children of the forest want to they the feeling you get from the wildlings from the the free folk is that they live in sort of peaceful coexistence with the children of the forest they may not necessarily see them all to the time but they certainly believe in their existence and they're certainly not out to sort of hunt them down and kill them they're not out to destroy weirwood trees so there is for me there's no particular motivation either um but i will i will have a little look if i see something that i think is a connection about something else happening in the rest of the world then i will let people know a next live stream um Question from J Kelsey fifty five. Thank you very much. Saying hi, Robert. Do you think there's any chance that Fagon goes through to uh, to the Reach to defeat uh, to defend Old Town and get a coronation like Aegon the First instead of going straight to King's Landing? He could build his army and starve the capital like Renly. Um. Uh, yeah. Is there a chance? Yes, but I don't think it's likely. I don't think it's likely for a few reasons. The first reason is that this is where um, Euron is at the moment, and by the time Fagon has established himself in King's Landing, I think there's a, a reasonable chance by then Euron may well have destroyed or blown up or burned down Old Town, so that won't be there. Um, the second point i think is that the 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 idea of the, when aegon the first initially did it this was um because that was the home base of the faith of the seven that was where the high septon was and so uh, it was important that at the you know their equivalent of the vatican that's where it happened but do they move to the home base so the starry sept which is the the big sept in old town is still there but the high septum moved up to king's landing a, a, a while later when the great sept was built and that then became the the, the center of the political life and that was where the kings were crowned certainly the recent kings have been crowned so there's um uh in fact i was just 
um, recently looking back through the Dance of the Dragons, and Aegon the Second was crowned in the dragon pit. So yes, there is a mirroring if he'd gone all the way over to Old Town and if Fagon goes all the way over to Old Town, a mirroring, mir uh, mirroring of Aegon's invasion. Uh, but I think given the situation, he will be wanting to get the people of King's Landing on his side. And I think that a coronation there in King's Landing would work for him absolutely perfect. And if he can get the High Septon, um, whoever the new High Septon is, I think that the High Sparrow will be gone by that point uh, to be crowning him, then I think that that will make him be this kind of beloved character that all the hints are going to happen. He's going to be a good king, I think, for the very short period of time there, or at least, if not a good king, then a popular one. So I think he's probably going to get himself crowned in King's Landing. Um, question from... Uh, I did have one more from Jay McDonald. Thank you very much. Uh, saying, hi, Robert. When Hard Home was destroyed hundreds of years ago, what was happening um, in Westeros more generally around that time? Do you think the children of the forest are involved in the attack, intensity of the attack? I think that's the same question I answered just a moment ago. So uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for that. I will... So I will have a look and see whether I can see anything specific. It's not, I mean, it's a question I get asked every now and then about the attack on Hard Home. My, I've heard some random theories about it that this was um, people just, or maybe the faceless men practicing the Doom of Valyria or something like that. But this was, this was a, decades beforehand i think it was like 80 years or something before the doom of valyria so it was um a very very long time um and it wouldn't be the same people doing it it would then have, have to pass it on down and i don't think that it was that just uh, to be clear um so uh, what was going on well this was at the in the latter days of the valyrian um World uh, Valyrian freehold control. Um, the in it just about started to expand a little bit westwards. They gained uh, Dragonstone. Uh, the Seven Kingdoms were squabbling kingdoms. It wasn't just um, we we call, talk about Seven Kingdoms, but um, they sort of shifting in and out of each other all the time. Uh, so uh, there, there wasn't anything specific that I can uh, think of. Okay, let's go back to the, uh, the Stormlands. Uh, two hundred Lone Wolf says two hundred years between Hard Home and the Doom. Uh, yes, yeah, so it was a, it was a long time between the two. Um, question from. Uh, the Lady Gordon saying, hi, Robert, hope all is well. It is, thank you. My question about the Kingswood, did it and the Crown Lands belong to the Stormlands before the Targaryens came? Um, some of it. So the, before the Targaryens came, there was this ongoing battle between uh, the Storm King, which was, uh, this was the Durandans who... So the Baratheons weren't there before the Targaryen invasion. The Baratheons put the, the Targaryens put the Baratheons there. It was House Dundon who was still in control, the Storm Kings. Um, and you had the King of the Isles and the Rivers, Harren the Black, who was uh, an Iron Islander, but had extended the kingdom out into the Riverlands. Uh, and it was he who built Harren Hall. And there was sort of squabbling going on about that the area between their two kingdoms, which was sort of going to and fro quite a bit. So um, at different times, it was held by different people. Uh, the, the history with House Durandon is largely that they uh, they solidified around Storm's End and they sort of expanded out, a bit like the Starks did. It solidified around Winterfell and expanded out to control all of the north. The, the House Durandon did the same down in the Stormlands and sort of slowly expanded out, but occasionally they had battles um, with others and they had long-running battles, I should probably say, in case it doesn't come up, uh, with Dawn all the way through. The Marcher Lords, the the, the Dornish marches 
there are a number of houses placed in the Dornish marches, those hills nearest to Dorn and also nearest to the Reach. And those houses were there. They were very martial houses, houses that had this role of protecting the Stormlands against these other nations. Um, Sylvester Snow saying, um, do you think Oris Baratheon was truly the bastard half-brother of Aegon the Conqueror? If so, uh, one might expect there to be more evidence of the blood of the dragon in House Baratheon, but there never seems to be any evidence of purple eyes or blonde hair that is prominent in the Targaryen bloodline. Thoughts on this? Uh, really loving the Lord of the Rings videos right now, as well as these live streams. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying the Lord of the Rings videos. Plenty more to come where that came from. Um, if you do like, incidentally, if you do like Lord of the Rings, I'm doing... Uh, a whole series of videos on Lord of the Rings, the background. If you're, it, there's going to be a massive budget TV show coming in about a year. Amazon have got the rights to the world of the Lord of the Rings, the Second Age. And uh, if you just feel like you need to catch up on the world of, uh, of Tolkien and Middle Earth before that, then uh, please do check out the videos. Uh, but the question here about. Um, uh, Oris Baratheon, who was the Baratheon who was installed, I've mentioned a moment ago, the Baratheon who was installed in, in Storm's End and basically given the Stormlands by the Targaryens. Um, so he was the right-hand man of Aegon the Conqueror. And the legends were, the rumours were, that he was the bastard brother of Aegon the Conqueror. And you're right, he didn't seem to have many of the Valyrian uh, sort of features that we're told about. Now, we don't know anything. If that is true, we don't know who uh, his other parent was. So um, there's no reason to think that the uh, the Targaryen genetic look would pass down to him in particular. Uh, and, and in fact, many Targaryens, um, when you start reading back through the histories, haven't had that kind of Valyrian look about them. Uh, so um, there are hints, however, going through the sort of the Baratheon family history that this might well have been the case. There is a very clear willingness among the Targaryens to intermarry with the, the Baratheons uh, to an extent that wasn't true for other Westerosi houses. You get, obviously, they most often, um, if they weren't marrying other Targaryens, they would be mar uh, marrying the Valarions or perhaps the Celtigars, um, because they had Valyrian blood in them. But on Westeros mainland, then the favorite family were the Baratheons. They married into them two, three times, I think. Uh, and so that seems to imply um, that they're aware, they were aware that there was potentially some Valyrian blood um, uh, there in the, the history of, of the family. Uh, and there are also hints about the the Targaryens it's said all the way through fire and blood. It, it turns out not to be a hundred percent true, but they seem to have a um, a greater ability not to get many diseases. And we often get these kind of throwaway remarks in things like the World of Ice and Fire or Fire and Blood about how uh, the Baratheons seem to avoid it, such and such a thing when others got them. It's not a hundred percent, quite a long way from it, but it's mentioned more than you might expect. Um, and added to which, grayscale does seem to affect those with uh, with Valyrian heritage a little bit more than others uh, because of its history. And of course, you get Shireen, who suffers from grayscale. So there are hints there, even if it's never truly said. And frankly, even if it were not the case that there were Targaryen uh, there was uh, that Oris was a half brother of Aegon. Then they intermarried a couple of times after that, anyway. So there was Targaryen blood in the family tree, anyway. Um, J. Kelsey fifty-five saying, "If Aegon has taken Storm's End, do you think it was a trick? 
Many people think it was the Golden Company banners matching Baratheon ones, but it seems too simple. Um, okay, I've got a couple of questions on Storm's End and Fagon, which I will answer a little bit later. So I'll wrap up some of this uh, then. Uh, but I'll say this now, that this is the invasion. This is Fagon's invasion, which is happening right at the moment in the books, actually. Uh, he's just landed, and then in a couple of the pre-released chapters from the Winds of Winter, we get sort of hints, and then we also get this mention that Storm's End has fallen to him uh, in one of the Ariane chapters, the pre-released chapters that we have. Now, um, is this a trick? I... I don't think so. I think he has actually taken Storm's End. I think that he's not taken it by um, a, a full-scale assault. I think he's he has done it by trickery, uh, but um, I'll come on to exactly how I think he will have done that when we get there. So, um, uh, no, I don't think that he's pretending to have got it. I think he has actually got it. Um I've got a few questions about Ned Stark and Robert Baratheon. So uh, I'll try and pick up on the say, Sylvester Snow saying, hello, Robert, do you think... Uh, no, actually, it's the wrong one. Um, I've got... Um, I did actually copy across who this was, so apologies, but thank you. Uh, we have a patron this was saying, I've always been confused by Ned not souring on Robert earlier in life for his drinking, uh, whoring and fathering of bastards. Liana immediately saw the flaws in Robert, and she was around Robert far less than Ned was. Based on the versions of Ned and Robert that we see, it's hard to imagine them liking each other, let alone being more than brothers. How did Ned miss this for so long? Um... I think I, I find this fascinating um, little dynamic that we've got going on. Now, it's very clear to me that Ned was very fond of and looked up to his older brother, Brandon, uh, who was in many ways very similar to Robert Baratheon. He was very headstrong. He uh, seemed to enjoy the company of women. He seemed to um, charge off to do things all the time, uh, not necessarily thinking through his actions. Uh, so I have a feeling that Ned kind of liked Robert because of the fact that he reminded him of his big brother, who he'd been forced to leave. Um, let's not forget Ned, as a child, was sent away from his home, his family, and everyone he'd ever known, and plonked somewhere that he didn't know anyone, and then he suddenly found that he was effectively being given a new brother, a foster uh, brother, who was very like his own brother. So I think that is where that connection came from. Um, and if you wish to continue that psychoanalysis you have to say well probably you could look at Robert Baratheon and say that he could look at his his younger brother Stannis and see someone who's um, always caring about doing his duty and and um, uh, not getting up to all of the hijinks that he did and all the rest of it and perhaps Robert at that time did really respect that um so maybe that's what the dynamic was. Um, uh, I don't know. It certainly seemed to be a yin and yang thing. And certainly rereading the Ned chapters, the Eddard chapters in the Game of Thrones, he does genuinely remember him fondly. He does genuinely think of him as a brother uh, or more than a brother, closer than brothers. There's, I mean... I did a live stream ages ago with Matt, Joe Magician, where we were just playing with this idea of what does more or closer than brothers actually mean? Because could you imagine closer than uh, brothers in that, that we're being told continually about the strength of family ties, but closer than that, what does that actually mean? But uh, leave that in foil to one side. Um, the, the, the fact is that they did just get on. And I think that we just have to accept this, and they seem to have enjoyed each other's company. Ned enjoyed the fact that he had somebody who didn't wasn't weighed down with the weight of responsibilities that he felt, and I think that Robert Baratheon enjoyed the fact that there was someone here who wasn't just going along with him, but actually stood up to him uh, sometimes. Um, 
Eric Harker saying, hello, Robert. I've come across The Ice Dragon by George R. R. Martin. Can you elaborate on how this story fits into the world of ice and fire? Uh, and Robert is a lot like Sir Lionel Baratheon, I thought. Uh, yes, uh, the second bit, this is Robert Baratheon with Sir Lionel Baratheon. He's the character from Duncan Egg era, uh, Sir Lionel Baratheon. Um, and it, this actually, this is, you get a lot of the Baratheons share a very clear trait. If you look at it, Oris Baratheon seems to have, have shared Rogar Baratheon. Lots of different Baratheons seem to have this kind of thing that, that Robert had. So that does seem to be quite a, a family trait going on there. As for the Ice Dragon, I did read it a long time ago. Um, so uh, I, I'm not going to go into the detail of it. But what I will say is that George R. R. Martin has never been drawn into the idea that this is part of the world of Ice and Fire. He's um, the, and this is about an Ice Dragon, but that would completely change a lot of the way that he's developing this story. And so, um, whereas, yes, it does appear to be, he's not been drawn into this, uh, at least as far as I've seen, into actually saying, yes, this is part of the canon of A Song of Ice and Fire. This is just something that we can see and read through his thinking and how he believes that magic operates and the like. So I would... Um, in fact, I was talking about Joe Magician um, a moment ago. If you're after somebody who does go into what George R. R. Martin writes in his other stories, uh, Preston Jacobs, I think, does this as well, um, and then tries to extrapolate from them into what is happening in the world of Ice and Fire, I would highly recommend you go and check out them. Personally, I don't think George R. R. Martin does that. I, th I Personally, I think that Yes, he. There, there may well be themes which run across all of his writing. Um, no writer can ever truly escape who they are and, and their background and history, no matter how fantastic the world they create. But uh, I think that he has created a distinct and different world in the world of ice and fire that is not the same as what he has created elsewhere. Um, question from Reflective Rambling. Hi there. Saying, uh, Professor Chaos. Oh, this is, uh, thank you. You're doing this again. Picking up questions from people in the chat. I love it when you do that. I can't always pick up on uh, all the questions. So uh, if they're in a super chat, then I definitely do see them. Uh, Professor Chaos saying, finally catching you from the start, a day off from teaching. Oh, well, um, great to have you. Um, going along with your theory on Euron equals Saruman, do you think Cersei will fulfill a worm tongue role and be the one to kill him? Um, okay, so this is getting back into my sort of extrapolating the the links between Lord of the Rings and the Song of Ice and Fire. Now, the for those who haven't come across this, we've talked a lot about, to, to death, I think, a lot of the time, this George R. R. Martin saying that the ending will be bittersweet. And everyone says, what does bittersweet mean? And they try to explain. Uh, but he actually explains what he means by bittersweet in that quote uh, that was from a few years ago. And, and he said it's like the scouring of the Shire. Uh, which is the penultimate chapter of the Lord of the Rings. Um, and he says that that, he thinks, he says it's an excellent piece of writing. Uh, and each time he reads it, he he rates it even higher. Um, and he says that if it, what he wants for the end of A Song of Ice and Fire is to capture the feeling of that, the bittersweet nature of what is going on, um, and part of this bittersweetness, he references Frodo. Um, and what I was talking about earlier was the fact that it is bittersweet that Frodo did get the victory in the end, but he didn't get it in the way that perhaps he was hoping he would. And he could not enjoy the fruits of the victory that he gained. Um, but the scouring of the Shire is... Uh, at a very high level, the hobbits, after going through all of their adventures and all of the big, uh, big plot, has been dealt with. Sauron's gone, the rings destroyed, and all the rest of it. And they come back to the Shire. So they come back to where it all started with. But the Shire 
the Shire's been taken over and it's been uh, it's not this rural idyll that they had been fighting for all this time. And it turns out the Saruman's there, uh, the Saruman being effectively the, the second big baddie, and he is there, and they then have to defeat him themselves using all of the skills and resources that they've been gaining through this uh, journey. So uh, my... Um, feeling then is that if we're get, if we're to take this and George R. R. Martin tells us that we ought to take this and say okay how might this apply to the world of ice and fire once the big plot points have been dealt with ice and fire ice being the others fire being the dragons once that's been dealt with we then have this final threat who is from the second big baddie uh, who is, in my mind, Euron. So that is where it is. Um, do I think this means that Cersei will kill him because Scream of Worm Tongue killed uh, Euron? I don't personally think so, because I don't think Cersei's taking on the Gream of Worm Tongue um, role. Uh, I don't think there is one um, for Euron. I think he's a different character, so I think that's where the analogy ends uh, to be honest i like the idea i like the idea that perhaps she could get to the point where uh, she turns on him but no i don't i don't think so so um uh, i think that was all of that question was um i think that euron potentially will die in a battle above the God's Eye Lake on um, dragons. That's just a, a theory that I, I have that seems to fit a lot of the foreshadowing that uh, George R. R. Martin has been dropping in recently. Uh, Zach Berger saying, in Fire and Blood, uh, Jaehaerys' time with Alison is described as an Eden. Do you think the use of this word by in-world characters means uh, Judeo-Christian religion exists in A Song of Ice and Fire? Does it mean that uh, there's an Eden-like myth in Westeros? That's interesting. Um, I hadn't picked up on that word. I assume that this is used by um, uh, in Fire and Blood, uh, therefore by Archmaester Gildane, who wrote it. Um, now, I think this is just a language usage thing. I, I, I think that there are various other, and I'm struggling to think of one off the top of my head, but there are various other uh, words within the English language that George R. R. Martin uses within the world of ice and fire that have their own uh, connotations that, that we have got um, that... Um, uh, do not mean that they have got the same mythology there or the word derivation there. Uh, so um, I th my, my take is that this is just him searching for a way, him being George R. R. Martin, searching for a way to show quite what a Jaehaerys fanboy Archmaester Gildane was, and he was undoubtedly, uh, in my view, at least in writing that book, and he was wanting to show us what overblown language would be used of some uh, kings um, uh, because he wants us to understand that written history is not objective. This is a subjective history. This is one person's perspective on what was going on. And uh, so if he can use hyperbole within that, um, then that allows us to understand the biases of the writer, uh, the in-world writer. Now, so I, I think the short answer on, on your question of whether or not this, the use of that word, Eden, uh, is uh, implicit of um, a Judeo-Christian uh, style mythology within A Song of Ice and Fire, I think the short answer is no. Um, the other thing that I would say is that George R. R. Martin has said on several occasions he is not a philologist. He is not a student of language. He has not invented any of the languages that are um, that are there, Dothraki, High Valyrian. He came, comes up with a few words of it, and then he um, leaves it to... Uh, on the TV show, it was... Um, 
and I've forgotten his name, someone Peters, uh, who's a fantastic uh, language creator, if such a thing is a job, and if anyone has it, it's him, um, to create the, the language. He merely creates the words and the sounds and all the rest of it. And so that includes, I would say, although he doesn't explicitly say it this way, the the common Westerosi tongue, uh, which is a tongue which is in use there. Not everybody is using it, but it will be the one that that in world that book is being written in. Uh, and so that is more of a, a slip than an, anything else, I would personally argue. Uh, but interesting uh, question. Um, Vera Glauben saying, or Glauben saying, Hi Robert, I remember that Robert Baratheon was fostered at the Eyrie, but his father, the Lord of Storm's End, died when Robert was quite young. Who ruled the Stormlands while he was in the Vale? Um, how did he return there, and at which point did he give st the Stormlands to Renly? Okay, so this is um, the, the background to Robert Baratheon is that, yes, he was fostered at the Eyrie. His father, Stefan, was sent um, on a mission across to Essos by Aerys II, the Mad King, uh, to try and find a bride for Rhaegar. That mission was a failure. He came back. There was a shipwreck and um, Stefan died and then Robert Baratheon became the Lord. Now, he carried on spending most of his time in the Eyrie, even though he was by that point then the Lord of Storm's End. Um, so uh, who was actually ruling? Well, the first thing to say is that there was... Uh, this isn't as long a period of time as you might think it was, because um, Rhaegar meeting Elia, marrying Elia, and then having two children with Elia happens um, within the space of about two and a half years. It's scary quick. Uh, Rhaegar was not hanging around. He he got married as quick as he could, had children as quick as he could. The the, the gap between having the children was as minuscule as you could possibly imagine um, uh, to the level of ickiness. Um, and so Robert Baratheon, probably it was about three years that he was in the Eyrie a lot of the time and not actually doing being Lord of Storm's End. Uh, so who, um, who was ruling in his dead well he technically was uh, so he will have been um sent messages and all the rest of it uh while uh, that was going on there was uh, a castellan at storm's end who the person sort of left in charge um who was a guy i had to write down his name sir harbert he's not doesn't play any role in this story whatsoever but he just does get a mention um and he at some point dies and is replaced by Courtney Penrose, who we do know from the uh, the, the books. Um, now, so they probably did a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff. Stannis was there um, as the next oldest son, and he will obviously will have felt that he had to do his duty. And Maester Cresson was also there. And from what we learn is that he also played quite an active role. Uh, so the, although there wasn't a specific person, I think the takeaway point we have here is that there were lots of people who were doing all of this. But the takeaway point is that Robert was the ruler, but he couldn't be bothered to rule. The, the, the thing he ought to have done you're absolutely right, is stayed in Storm's End at that point, mourned his father, taken over, and then ruled from that point on. Um, but he didn't. He was enjoying his time far too much when he was over in the Eyrie and the Vale, and he was nipping there all the time. He, he didn't care about ruling. And this is uh, in-world foreshadowing of what he would be like when he was an actual king. And if anyone had sort of stepped, you know, stopped and thought about it, they would have gone, actually, you know what? He loves all this warfare stuff, but he 
he won't enjoy being king. So it was it was George R. R. Martin giving us a little hint of what was to come with him. Uh, Lady Eternal. Um, hi there, Lady Eternal. By the way, I got your message just very quickly. Uh, apologies if I missed uh, a couple of your questions last time. I will. Um, uh, uh, it does sometimes happen. It's just my uh, my pure oversight on my part. I do apologise, but I'll try and reply to them over on um, uh, Patreon itself. Uh, but uh, I've got your questions for this time, um, saying um, I don't know if it was made explicit in the text at any point, but I seem to remember it being said that Stannis was made Prince of Dragonstone because uh, that had been the traditional seat of the heir apparent under the Targaryens once the heir came of age, and Robert was either convinced or decided on his own to preserve some of those forms in order to stabilise his reign in the early days. Do you think that Robert would have given Stannis Storm's End once Joffrey came of age if he'd lived? Or do you think that giving Stannis Dragonstone really was a slight as Stannis believed, with the rationale about Stannis being his heir and misdirect for public consumption? Um, okay, so after... And I think I've got another couple of questions related to this in just a moment. After Robert became king, um, he he didn't have an heir. So his assumed heir was Stannis, his next el oldest brother. And yes, the, historically, uh, it didn't happen every time, but historically the Prince of Dragonstone would be uh, the heir to the throne and they would be on Dragonstone. Um, most recently, Rhaegar had um, had been based on Dragonstone, uh, but it happened with a lot of different Targaryen kings now uh, and their heirs. So this was technically an okay thing to do. Now, however, just because that's what the Targaryens did doesn't mean that that's what Robert Baratheon had to do. The Targaryens liked Dragonstone. That was their ancestral home. So this was actually a nice place for, for them to go. This is where all the dragons were and things like that. So um, Robert Baratheon didn't have to do that. He could have come up with any old thing. Um, he could have it, it probably worked quite well to say, actually, the the heir to... to King's Landing is the Lord of Storm's End. He could have said that if he wanted to, but uh, he gave it to Stannis now, and that he made Renly the Lord of Storm's End. Now, Stannis obviously took this as a slight, um, and uh, because he didn't want to go there, and he thought, I think quite rightly, that Robert was angry with him for letting the Targaryen children escape. It wasn't Stannis's fault, but Robert was so focused on killing all Targaryens that the person he had tasked with uh, getting them um, was Stannis, and Stannis did not achieve that aim. So um, you're asking, would he have given it to um, Joffrey when Joffrey reached uh, his majority? I mean, possibly, but I think that the the fact is that he wasn't that bothered and I think that given the fact that Cersei would have wanted Joffrey to be staying around in King's Landing probably would have meant that he would have gone along with it because it's just easier uh, so I don't think he would have done I think he would quite happily leave leave Stannis there um, was it a punishment I think it probably was I think Stannis was probably right there Robert Brathen could have done other things and he decided to do that um, and Storm's End was their family home, and he gave that to Renly. So, yeah, I think it was a, uh, a bit of a slap in the face, and I think uh, it, it was the kind of thing that you could do without, you know, you could pretend that this was the entirely right and honourable thing to do when you're honouring them, and he couldn't turn it down. But at the same time, the aspect... Uh, Josh uh, Sagar, do you see Gendry as fulfilling a similar final role as being the heir to House Baratheon in the books and the show, albeit with a more setup and sense? Um, so the Gendry character that they have had on the show was largely an amalgamation of Gendry uh, in the books and also Edric Storm, who is um, a bastard 
um, who's based at Storm's End. So now I think out of the two, and I will come back to this a little bit later, but of the two, Edric Storm seems to be more likely. Um, uh, he was the person who um, Davos saved, incidentally, from uh, Alessandra uh, and put into the rowboat, um, except he didn't put him in, in a rowboat sa sailing around forever and ending up in King's Landing. He actually just sent some men off uh, to go and take him over to Lys uh, over in the Free Cities. Um, question from Cloaked Ones. Uh, oh, in fact, a co uh, combo of questions from Hi, I'm Alison, Ryan Tierney, a constant Blanchard. Uh, who do you think will end up in control of Storm's End in the books? Will it be Edric? Will Edric and Shireen ever meet? Uh, okay, so this is the the same question. I, I'll I'll try and pick up on some of this. Um, the questions from later, I'll kind of bring forward. Will uh, Edric, Storm, and Shireen ever meet? No, I'm I don't think so. Uh, Edric is over, as I say, he's over. I think it's in lease at the moment. Um, he's well out of the way. Uh, Shireen is up at the wall and she is going to be killed up there. So Edric and Shireen will not ever meet. Um, the Edric, I suspect, could be brought back. Um, he could be brought back into things if, um, as is the way, we will suddenly find that um, Fagon... Aegon the Sixth will want to try and make himself look like a king. And one of the things about making yourself look like a king is, yes, you have to get your king's guard set up. Yes, you've got to get crowned. Yes, you've got to have all of the accoutrements like the, you know, the sword, Blackfire, and all the rest of it. He's, he's going to do all those things. But he will need to be um, making sure that he has allies in the places where he wants them to be. Um, uh, what this means is that the parts of the Seven Kingdoms that he has conquered, he will then need to put people into. Now, at the moment, the parts of the Seven Kingdoms that he has conquered, it's the Stormlands, or bits of the Stormlands. He will get King's Landing, but obviously he will be in charge of King's Landing. Who do, He has to leave somebody in charge of uh, Storm's End, because it is... Um, it's an important castle, but it's also historically it is one of the um, the places where you would put one of the the lords of the realm, one of one of the seven kingdoms. Um, who does he put there? Well, the Baratheons as a whole are all gone. Stannis is not. Yeah, Stannis is still alive, but he's not about to bend the knee to Fagon. So either uh, Fagon creates a completely new family and says, you're now in charge of the Stormlands, which he could, for someone like John Connington, say, but I don't think that's going to happen, because I think John Connington is going to be uh, our POV by the side of, uh, of Fagon, so we see what's going on with him, so I don't think he's going to be staying uh, at Storm's End. Or he could get a character who he thinks is going to be loyal to him and place him there, which is how someone like Edric Storm could come into play. Um, so it's it's possible. Uh, it's possible. I, I mean, I don't think it's actually plot um, important. It's quite hard to say. There are so many things going on in the story, but I don't think it is central to the to driving the plot forward. Um, what, what is important is the fact that in order to establish his, uh, his kingship, his feel of kingship, um, then um, he needs to be putting people into King's Landing, so he will have to leave someone there. Um, so I hope that one answers uh, that combo of questions. And Melky Himeneth saying, I never knew quite how deep A Song of Ice and Fire was until I chanced upon your channel. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm glad I'm opening it up to you. I thank you for the countless hours of pure bliss I've had since, uh, thanks to your expertise and imagination. Oh, thank you. I, I really appreciate that. That's very kind of you. Uh, so uh, thank you, uh, Melky. 
Um, let's uh, go to um, Lawn Duck 20. I said just a couple of other questions which were around the same um, issue about who uh, Storm's End was given to. Lawn Duck 20 saying, hello, Robert. Why do you think Robert gave uh, Storm's End to Renly instead of Stannis? Um, Maester Crescent told Stannis he did it because he needed a strong ruler on Dragonstone, but Stannis believes it was because he allowed Viserys and Daenerys to escape. Uh, I think I've uh, answered that one already. Um, also, Stannis respected Ned, but seemed this is Ned Stark, but seems to be jealous of him as well. Do you think this was because he was passed over as Hand of the King, or is it because Robert seemed to love Ned more than his actual brothers? This is an interesting one. So. Uh, Stannis and Ned didn't really know each other that well, is probably the starting point we have to say. So Ned spent his childhood uh, first in Winterfell, then in the Eyrie. Uh, Stannis sent, spent his mostly down in Storm's End. So they will only have met at maybe at tourneys um, uh, and then later on, when Stannis had been holding Storm's End all through Robert's Rebellion and then Ned freed him from that. Uh, but after that, Ned went back up north and was hardly seen again. He appeared again just uh, with the Greyjoy Rebellion, but other than that, he was trying to stay away from things. So Ned and, and Stannis didn't really know each other that well. But there is a sort of edge to... Um, to, to Stannis when he talks about Ned, which he does a couple of times. One of them, at the wall, he talks to John, and he says, um, he says, your father was no friend of mine, but only a fool wouldn't recognise his honour, or something along those lines. Um, and it's the, he was no friend of mine, is an, an odd way of putting it, is that, you know, I didn't know him very well, he could have said. Um, but the implication was that there was something there. Now, we never really dig into this. George R. Martin doesn't. I think that there probably is some element of jealousy. They're connected in with what I was saying about the dynamics between uh, Ned and his brother Brandon and Robert and his brother uh, Stannis, that um, Robert never, it would appear, is really had a great relationship with Stannis and Eve, even at the best of times. Uh, Stannis, um, well, Ned went and in, um, in, in the mind of Robert Baratheon, rescued Stannis and Storm's End, and he did it in a day. The moment that Ned appeared, suddenly all the Tyrells just upped and left the field. Um, so he was the hero there, whereas Stannis quite rightly thought... You know what? I'm, uh, I'm the actual hero. I held this. I, we were down to uh, hunting rats in the basement and uh, and all the rest of it to stay alive. <coughs> Pardon me. So there was probably a little bit of bitterness there. Um, added to yes, surely Stannis should have been made. Not surely, but he could have been made um, hand of the king. But King Robert didn't seem to. Th even think about it he just went straight to go get Ned um who let's face it yes he was good friends with Robert Baratheon and yes he knew how to be a ruling lord but he didn't know anything about how King's Landing worked whereas Stannis did Stannis would have been a more obvious choice so there are layers there um but I don't I don't think it was hatred or in, in any way I think they respected each other it's just that they never quite clicked um those two people um cloaked one thank you again just picking up for something for fletcher reed that's very kind cloaked one i do appreciate this uh saying what is the stormlands economy based on oh good question um we're well george, george R. martin i have to say just at the top for someone who has um critiqued Tolkien's lack of um, detailing um, tax and economy within Middle-earth. He also is quite vague um, and sometimes quite high level. How have the Lannisters 
why are they so rich? Well, they've got a gold mine. Okay, that's quite um, straightforward. Well, but so we we get a few hints about what the uh, economy of the uh, the Stormlands based on. Um, there is a port, but it's not a large port. So unlike uh, King's Landing, Dusk and Dale. Um, uh, Planky Town. If you move on further south, that there's there's no huge port, so import and export there isn't great. However, they have got the King's Road, which goes up to King's Landing. Now, in terms of what they produce, the 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 land is actually quite lush. It's it rains a lot, but it's also quite warm because it's relatively south. And so what they have got is a lot of quite lush land. And unlike, say, um, the the Reach or in the, the Vale of Arryn itself, um, they don't seem to have huge agriculture. Yes, there are some bits of agriculture, but uh, there are large swathes of forest. And so foresting certainly appears to be quite a large part of this. Um, and uh, managing that foresting so from uh they they get the timber that there's definitely there's talk of the timber being uh, used and exported uh, and also hunting for uh game within there is also um talked about but the the stormlands are different this is a very variegated geographical area you get these lush um forested areas that they seem to that seems to be the basis of their economy then you get the stuff on the coast uh which um, they tend to be um most a lot more focused in on the sort of the proximity it's two weeks away from king's landing which at the time was actually not all that far and then you get the march of lords in the dornish marches where it is a lot more kind of austere and that is a lot more martial so the the economy doesn't seem to be very developed uh, but um, there's a huge amount of emphasis on martial prowess and the build-up of the military so it's a lot more what i suppose we might call state run um, uh, military um, uh, militaristic society um question uh and cloaked one again thank you so much uh really appreciating uh this um saying for fletcher reed what part of stannis and Renly's upbringing caused their personalities to be so different if it's at all that simple again i think i had a question on this so apologies if you're a patron i will try and tie in this to one of the questions over there as well um there's there's no simple answer to that. The you can get into your sort of like uh, basic psychology, if you wish, and say Robert Baratheon seems to have the stereotypical Baratheon temperament. Um, because of that, Stannis seems to have felt that he has this kind of elder child syndrome that he has to be the responsible one. He has to look after stuff and all the rest of it. Um, Renly has the classic younger child syndrome of um, I'm just going to enjoy life. Um, and this does come around to um, Renly's peach, which is something that people talk about a lot um, uh, within the fandom. It's... Uh, because Stannis thinks about it a lot, and obviously there are connotations to it. But um, when they meet for this parley, the two of them, Stannis and Renly, and they're basically Renly has, is there having got all of these lords supporting him and his claim to be king, and Stannis thinks that he ought to be the one that everybody's rallying behind. Uh, Stannis offers him a peach, and uh, Renly can't stop thinking about it afterwards and it is symbolic george R. martin has talked about it it's that what this is is symbolic and renly tries to explain this to a degree this is symbolic of renly's approach to life and attitude is that this is about you should enjoy it you should stop every now and then and just eat a peach because it's nice to eat a peach um uh and stannis never does he just always just does what he ought to do and he never just sits down and enjoys the moment uh, and that is that is the difference in their kind of approaches to life 
Um, is there a, a moment in their life that you could pinpoint for that? No, I don't think so. Uh, but I think it's uh, it's just um, the way that uh, that people often turn out to be. Robert Baratheon is the stereotypical uh, Baratheon lord, and then the others follow the more classic uh, sort of what psychologists would, pop psychologists anyway, would have uh, um, siblings. Uh, Dominic Vaughan, thank you so much for the uh, super chat saying full question below. Let me see whether I can find that. Uh, saying, what do you think of uh, Robert Baratheon's relationship with Joffrey? The incident with the cat being killed as a child, etc. Did he actually infer he was a sociopath, uh, a sociopath quite early on? Um, I, I think that one of the fascinating things is how Robert Baratheon doesn't really pay huge amounts of attention to Joffrey or his children. This isn't um this isn't the thing that he's interested in. He we know what he likes doing. He likes fighting, he likes um chasing after women, he likes drinking, he likes carousing, he likes having a good time. Uh, that's what he enjoys. And so we actually don't get many um bits or times snapshots of him and Joffrey together. That's that's not their all at all much in fact when we're at Winterfell and um, Tyrion comes in to find the royal family and Robert Baratheon has gone off doing whatever he was and you get Jamie and Cersei and the children there and it's as if they're the family unit which obviously they are <laughs> but uh, that's the um, that's the feel that we get all the way through this is that Cersei is the one with the, has the close bond with the children um, Jamie obviously stays close, Robert Baratheon for the most part actually just ignores them um, I think that he probably did realise what Joffrey was like um, but the fascinating thing with Joffrey is he wanted to impress his father that that becomes very apparent that is one thing that he wants to do is he wants to impress his father and it's probably again getting back into uh the sort of the um uh cod psychology probably because of the fact that his father was ignoring him a lot and he wanted to have that fatherly recognition uh, and praise um Chelsea Oliver, thank you so much, saying, Hi, Robert, could the monarchy have been abolished if Robert did not have Targaryen ancestry and with the Targaryens dead or exiled? Um, I mean, yeah, yes, uh, it could have done the... the Iron Throne and the rulership of Westeros is not being passed down from one person to another because of some um, immutable law that everybody agrees who the next person is. It's not like, for example, in the British royal family where we know who is the uh, first in line to the throne, the 8th, the 15th, the 27th but in line to the throne. It's not that clear who is the next uh, person in line because almost every generation the targaryens fought over it it's this is one of the big takeaways from fire and blood is that if you thought that this was a, just a very clear succession of one person followed by another followed by another it was never that clear aegon obviously took the throne by force in, and created the throne in the first place then you get magor took the throne by force you get jaehaerys took the throne by force the dance of the dragons was effectively the Targaryens, two camps of Targaryens trying to take the throne by force. It's pretty much every generation. The Targaryens have a fight about who's, pardon me, who's next in line. Um, so the idea that um, Robert Baratheon claimed the throne because he, he was the person with the best claim actually is not, that, that doesn't kind of stack up in the way that that world seems to work. It's more that he, he took the throne. And then afterwards, uh, the maesters sort of came up with this, uh, yeah, that's because he's uh, he's got Targaryen blood in him and therefore he's, you know, partly in line. Uh, 
that's not that was nonsense. That everybody knew that that was a nonsense. It was just a made up reason that they they created after the event to try and justify it and all the rest of it. Um, because if if the Targaryen line of inheritance was important, then surely one of the living Targaryens should be the ruler, Viserys, for example. Um, if and if it wasn't important, then why on earth was, was he claiming that ancestry as being important? So it was. Robert Baratheon claimed the throne because he was because he wanted it. Similarly, um, as happened on the show, and I suspect we'll have something similar ish in the books. Cersei claims the throne, Cersei of House Lannister, first of her name. Um, so she claims it for the Lannisters, who had no other claim to it. No, they're not claiming it through the um, uh, the. Targaryen line of succession. She wasn't claiming it through the Baratheons. Yes, she had once been married to Baratheon, but she wasn't a Baratheon herself. So um, it was just because she was had the ability to do it and had the power. So uh, could the monarchy have ended at that point if Robert Baratheon, who had the power at that point, had said, you know what, let's give up having one ruler for all of the Seven Kingdoms. Um, I'll go back to ruling the, the Stormlands and you can all look after your own areas that's fine. It could have happened, but he didn't want to do that. So um, yes, it's, it was a theoretical possibility, but no, that's not the that's not the way he was going to work. Um, uh, I think well, let's go to some questions from my patrons. Um, Lady Eternal. Um, so it seems Ned, so this is picking up on what I was talking about, the misgivings with uh, Robert and Ned. Um, why do you think Ned ignored the, uh, Lyanna's misgivings? Was it because he understood that betrothal was part of his father's Southron ambitions? Or was he bl blinded to Robert's territorial behaviour towards Lyanna because of their friendship, mistaking what Robert felt about her for love instead of obsession, as it truly was? Yeah, I think it's a bit of both. It's the short answer. Um, the uh, Ned was close to... Robert Baratheon and so yes he wanted his mate uh, and he wanted to big up his mate to Lyanna and yes that probably did make him try and find excuses and all the rest of it also yes he will have been well aware of his father's desire to have uh, marriages I think uh, political marriages given the way that um, he in later life seemed to accept that you know Sansa had to go off and marry someone and he was, talks to Aya about she should marry someone um he's he's bought into this idea this uh what I, we would now call this patriarchal idea of the, the the head of the house decides who the other people within it should be marrying he's clearly bought into this and he thinks that that is Lyanna's place to do that so uh, to marry who she's told to marry so um uh, yes, it's partly his friendship blinding him to it. It's partly him understanding what his father's doing. And it's partly, to be honest, the fact Ned is not this, uh, by our standards anyway, this paragon of virtue. He does think that people ought to marry for the sake of Fort Duke because their father tells them they ought to marry. He thinks that that's the way it should go. Uh, Cranog woman, about the Baratheons, I have a question. In your opinion, would Renly have made such a bad king? Um, it's interesting. I think no, he wouldn't have made a bad king. I think is the answer. I think that he would have made a loved king. I don't think he necessarily would have um, been a the kind of king who. Uh, focused in on the making the world a better place he seems to i mean he was the master of laws for quite a while in king's landing so he understood how these things worked he seemed to have been turned up to all the meetings and all the rest of it so he was certainly capable of doing the day-to-day -day boring stuff but he just wanted to enjoy life and do and and have fun uh, and why not uh so yeah i think he probably would i mean this is the thing that george R. martin plays with quite a lot is um, 
who would make a good king? Who, which of the characters we've got? Fagon actually probably on paper would make a good king. He's been trained to think about and care about the uh, the least privileged in society. He's he's been he's been given lots of um, uh, tutoring on all sorts of uh, important matters. He spent his entire life learning about it and now finally he might be able to go out, go about and do something about it he probably would be a good king renly may well have been a good king but that doesn't mean that they're going to be king or king for long uh, so uh yeah i don't think he would have been bad and i think that he would have been liked a lot i suspect i mean it's probably a bit harsh on him but uh, viserys the first uh, who we will meet in the spin-off series, House of the Dragon. Um, Paddy Considine's going to be him. I suspect he's going to be a bit like that. He inherited, uh, that King Viserys, inherited uh, from Jaehaerys a good, prosperous um, country, continent. And he kept it going. He was loved by the people. He was he had lots of tourneys. He um, he seemed to have done good things without in any way leaving a huge imprint in the way that Jaehaerys did with these great building projects and um, uh, law changes and all the rest of it. He was just managed it in a sensible way. Um, uh, Sam Chastain, uh, again, about Ned's attitude towards Robert. Um, finding it strange to think that Ned still thinks of Robert as a close friend. It seems that Ned very carefully covered up everything that happened at the Tower of Joy and the parentage of John to avoid Robert's rage and the potential killing of his own nephew. Uh, I'm also excited to see Boros Baratheon in House of the Dragon. Uh, would love to know your thoughts on the character. Um, yeah, well, so just on the Ned thing, just as... Um, uh, wrapping the Ned Robert um, relationship up, when it gets to the part of the story we see in the Game of Thrones, um, yes, it. I completely understand this thought that you know, decade and a half has gone. He's not really seen his friend at all in that time, probably just the once, and yet he still seems to have this um, very positive attitude towards him. That does seem to go. It has to be said. Uh, I'm rereading A Game of Thrones at the moment or re-listening to it. Um, I've probably mentioned if you are interested in my thoughts as I go through, uh, look me up on Twitter. You'll find me. Uh, if you just look for In Deep Geek on Twitter, you will find me there. Um, but Ned, it's it becomes very apparent the further into the story we go, the more he turns from my friend Robert, who is great, and more towards the, I hope he's still the man he once was. I, and then it becomes that I fear he's not the man he once was. And so the more he sees of his erstwhile friend, the the more he realises the reality of what he is um, and perhaps what he always was. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's not a... Um, uh, it's, it's almost as if he could, uh, while they're apart, he could keep in his imagination, he could remember what they were like when they were... Uh, they were young, running around, having fun in the Eyrie. Um, but as as he meets him and gets to know him again as an older man and he starts to remember things, particularly with all the Liana stuff, he, he clearly had some PTSD going on there and he tried not to think about it. Um, Ned, this is. So, um, yes, he could think back to just the happy memories. Um, and that seems to have been his his coping mechanism all that time. Uh, question from Juliano Alano uh, saying, Hola from Brazil. Hello, Brazil. Uh, fakest money ever. Um, I have no idea what the the um, uh, the exchange rate is, but um, Thank you. I very, very much appreciate it. And I know that you're going through a tough time at the moment in Brazil. So um, all the best to you there. Uh, I wanted to know more about the most powerful houses of the Stormlands. Uh, Robert being half Estamont seems weird. Um, yeah, so I, di I did have a couple of questions about this again. I must seem to be always saying this. Um, but the, the houses in... Um, 
the the Stormlands. The, the headline is that there aren't many powerful houses in the Stormlands. There's not that not like that because it's a smaller area, uh, because it's much got much smaller armies as a whole despite the fact that they've got these marcher lords with these great martial prowess uh, they seem to be able to offer up one of the smaller sized armies out of all of the different regions of uh, the seven kingdoms so there aren't any mega powerful other families going on out there not like you have in the north you've got the the mandalays and the boltons or um down in the reach you've got the high towers there's no there's no a hugely powerful extra family going on there so you've got a few you've got house swan is probably the biggest and richest um you've got um the so again if you, it probably helps thinking about the the layout of the Stormlands in different parts. You get the Marcher Lords, you get the Dondarians who are there, um, which is a very, uh, 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 an old house, but a, a proud one. Um, uh, you get, uh, who else have you got? The Selmies, of course. <laughs> I forgot about the House Selmy. Uh, this is where Barristan Selmy comes from. Again, a history, a great sort of martial history there, being one of the Marcher Lords. Over when you get to the, um, the coast then you get house connington and then you get two biggish islands you get estamont and you get tarth and so all of those are big houses but they're not massive houses uh, so they're significant and known and all the rest of it but they're not like um not touching anything like the Valarions or the High Towers or any of the other the other kind of like uh, big and important second uh, ones. So being half Estamont may seem weird, but it's it's probably no more than uh, the fact that in the uh, the Starks it intermarried with lots of random houses up in the um, uh, in the north. So they. Um, well, yeah, it's, it's hard to find a house that they haven't intermarried with, actually, when you go back through their family tree. But uh, so this was just a matter of uh, one of the more powerful houses in the uh, in the Stormlands. Um, question from uh, Lee Roberts. No, I, actually, I'm going ahead of myself. Um, Dominic Vaughan. Um, Hi, Robert. Do we know if, if Robert Baratheon, even though fostered at the Eyrie, had any relationship with the ruling Targaryens? Uh, despite considering him uh, later his greatest nemesis, uh, would he and Rhaegar have known each other well? Um, uh, you also asked about the different, uh, the, the three different Baratheon brothers um, and how they turned out that way, which I think I've already answered. But in terms of did Robert Baratheon know the ruling Targaryens well? I mean, probably not well, um, but, uh, and being in the Eyrie actually, it means that he's sort of cut off a little bit because it is, you have to, it's quite hard actually getting there. You have to go through the mountains and all the rest of it. Um, so he was a little bit cut off. He will have, he will have met them I, at, Rhaegar definitely he was at tourneys we have records of them being at tourneys together so I mean took the tourney at Harren Hall obviously um and but the, there are previous tourneys where Robert Baratheon was there and we know Rhaegar was there so he will have met him and he will know him um but he didn't spend uh, Rhaegar spent his time King's Landing and then Dragonstone Robert Baratheon spent his time Storms End then the Eyrie. So they didn't cross all the time that they will have been aware of each other. And um but having said that they sort of met at Tony's, they probably weren't up against each other all that much. I've not sort of double checked. You can go through the every mention of every tourney and, and see who, who faced off against who. Um but Robert Baratheon tended to favor the melee, where he could go in with his big war hammer and just sort of fight people uh, on foot or, or um, uh, just in a sort of mass brawl, um, whereas Rhaegar favoured the, the jousting. Uh, so they actually didn't really come up against each other. They will have been in each other's orbits, but not, um, uh, not close. 
Um, uh, so, Bobbert Ross saying, hello, Robert, this is my first question uh, on Patreon, so uh, welcome. Uh, I wanted to know which of the Baratheon brothers would have made the best king. Donald Noy seems to think it was Robert, a.k.a. the True Steel. Um, yeah, I, th I think, um, to follow on from what I've said on this already, Robert Baratheon clearly know. Yes, he was a leader, and Donald Noy knew him as a leader, uh, but he was not a good king. Uh, in, by any stretch of the imagination. He, uh, as king, he ignored the matters of state uh, and he ignored advice. Uh, and as as a result, when he, he took over a kingdom that was in reasonably sound financial position and he left one that was almost crippled with debt. This was not good and sound management. Um, Stannis... I'm sure would have been a very competent king, um, dull but competent. Um, but I, I, I genuinely think Renly would have been, and this is just the George R. R. Martin irony. The person who would have been best king didn't get anywhere with it, um, uh, and they weren't in line. Um, question from uh, Nicola Trickler saying, uh, hi, Robert and Dan, the best doggo in the world. He is the best doggo in the world. Uh, I'm wondering what happened to the uh, relationship between Beric Dondarrion and Illyria Dane. Was their wedding prevented by Ned's mission? Why is she mentioned only as Beric's betrothed? I mean, wouldn't such a highborn lady be expected in court, maybe in dawn to Ariane? Uh, okay, so this is... Um, uh, Beric Dondarrion, who uh, we know... Uh, was um, he became the leader of the Brotherhood without banners, but Ned sends him out to um, to hunt down the Mountain, who's been committing atrocities. This is in Game of Thrones, Book One. As Hand of the King, Ned sends him out to hunt down the Mountain with this group of uh, soldiers. Now, this is interesting because why did he pick him? He could have picked anyone. Clearly, this is someone he trusts. Why would he? Why is this important? Well, because Beric Dondarrion was engaged to the um, younger sister of Arthur and Ashara Dane, and the Danes were um, the central family in the Rhaegar's group is his inner circle. Uh, Arthur, we know, was best friends with Rhaegar. Ashara was a uh, lady-in-waiting to um, Elia, Rhaegar's wife. And so they were absolutely central to this. Now, what happened when you start reading between the lines is that after this, everyone who was, after Robert's running, everyone who was close to uh, Rhaegar in any way, they were either killed or they went into hiding somewhere. Um, some even faked their own deaths. So you get who who was closest to him. Well, Arthur Dane died. Ashara Dane uh, allegedly killed herself. I suspect that wasn't exactly what happened, uh, but that was there. Richard Lonmouth disappeared. Uh, John Connington exiled. All of the people who were closest to Rhaegar were gone. Um, and House, da House Dane were the central house. And so it appears that what happened is that after Robert's Rebellion, they very sensibly, perhaps on advice from Ned, because he will have known what Robert Baratheon was like, they just kept their heads down. They did not get involved in any politics. They didn't get. They didn't go and uh, do anything much. Um, they just stayed very, very quiet for the next decade, decade and a half. Uh, but obviously they still wanted to be marrying people. Uh, they married, so they got uh, Illyria uh, engaged to, betrothed to Beric Dondarrion. Now, this is somebody they obviously will have to trust because they were very slowly trying to work their way back um, uh, into some sort of uh, society, um, still probably very wary of Robert Baratheon's wrath. So um, 
the fact that Ned chose Beric, I suspect, was at least in part because of there was this link of trust that they trusted Ned absolutely. They clearly trusted Beric absolutely. Ned trusted Beric absolutely. There was this circle of trust going on there that we haven't got all of the details of yet, but that was what was going on. Um, so um, in terms of uh, the the relationship between them, yes, they were just betrothed. Uh, she wouldn't have, um, uh, Illyria, she wouldn't have been to court because they were keeping a low profile. That's the short version of it, uh, to be honest. Um, Shasha saying, hi, Robert. I hope you and Dan are well. Thank you. The Baratheons were one of the most powerful families all through the Targaryen rule. Given that they were also characterized by stereotypical virility, uh, and some, um, as Robert and my personal favorite, Rogar, weren't shy to spread their seed, are there any cadet houses? Not counting Dragonstone and King's Landing, just somewhere in the Stormlands. I don't remember reading about them. And I always find it curious due to their stereotype, whereas the Honourable Starks have at least the Car Starks and the Grey Starks. Uh, granted, House Stark is very much older than House Baratheon. Might there still be some? Might there be some Cadet Durandons out there? Okay, so Durandons we don't know about. Um, I'm afraid um, the, the Baratheons. There certainly do appear to have been quite a lot of um, illegitimate Baratheon children out there, but they don't appear to have at any point been granted uh, cadet house status. Now, I think you've hit the nail on the head with uh, the Starks. Why the Starks have got a couple, um, there's also a cadet branch of a house Dane, incidentally, and House Lannister. Um, a cadet branch doesn't always just happen from being an illegitimate child. Sometimes it's um, a, a cousin or a, a younger younger son or something who's uh, given a house name of their own. Um, but um, it's simply that the House Baratheon has been around for 300 years, uh, how Stark has been around for thousands of years. So there's a there's a big difference there, and there's much more time uh, for that to happen. And a lot of the time, the, as you said, the Baratheons were very powerful. They were also often very linked in with uh, the Targaryens. And so if they were married to the Targaryens and there were some illegitimate children on the side, perhaps they did not wish to highlight that fact uh, by showering gifts and recognition on those illegitimate children. Um, so that's the the politics uh, that sort of underlies all of this as well. Um, Lee Roberts, can you talk a little bit about the Rainwood and its connection to the children of the forest? Um, in the Ariane Martel sample chapter, while exploring a cave system, she comes across a huge cavern filled with carved stone columns. Do you think there's any meaning to this? I was always under the assumption that the children only carved uh, faces into the trees. Um, thanks for everything. You're welcome. I actually dug this little um, section out to to read the so the. This is an Ariane chapter. It's a pre-released Ariane chapter from The Winds of Winter, so it might change. This isn't final. George R. Martin has told us he's changed at least one of the pre-released chapters. Um, and uh, so we can't take it as fully canon yet, um, but the situation here is that she is, Ariane is heading off to uh, try and hunt down Fagon trying to get to Storm's End. She's got this idea maybe also um, um, Quentin Martell might have arrived back. Um, no such luck there, obviously. But they're going through the Rainwood uh, on their way. You can get to Dawn up towards Storm's End through the Rainwood uh, and they get find a, a cave system uh, in the forest. Uh, all at once, she found herself in another cavern, five times as big as the last one, surrounded by a forest of stone columns. Damon Sand moved to her side and raised his torch. Look how the stone's been shaped, he said. 
Those columns and the wall there, see them? Faces, said Ariane. So many sad eyes staring. This place belonged to the children of the forest. So what we've got is under the rainwood, which we know in large part has been there as a forest ever since the children of the forest were around, and there are still weirwoods above ground underneath uh, is this cavern system we read about it. it seems very extensive and then we get these columns and on the walls there's some carvings carvings of faces now what does this mean yes i think this almost certainly is the children of the forest this means that um they didn't just carve in um uh, faces into weirwood trees unless these what we're looking at are not stone uh, pillars, but they are actually dead weirwood trees. It's possible. Um, who knows? Uh, but the carvings that are all around, um, that certainly seems to be um, from the children of the forest. Now, this does kind of build up to the possibility that we'll get some kind of messaging from the children of the forest, like we saw on the TV show in Dragonstone. That's entirely possible. Um, but uh, what seems to be the case is that there definitely were children in the forest here, but there are no longer. And this is how the children of the forest operate underground. So that's the the, the feeling we have. And we see that in um, when you get to Blood Raven's cave, that's um, they're in the caves underneath a weirwood tree. And also intriguingly, um, and, and I've not really thought this through but when we are thinking about the isle of faces in our mind and we don't we don't know what's there but there's lots of weirwood trees and all the rest of it um we should probably expect there to be some underground stuff to the isle of faces actually it's not just stuff happening above ground but the children of the forest seem to live in cave systems underground as much as anything else so if there are children of the forest there then perhaps and if we do ever see it then perhaps we should be looking just for things underground not just things above ground complete aside um question from um johnny giants bane saying good evening robert from the lands of always winter hi uh, i'm a new patreon member and have really loved your winds of winter narrations this week on the way to work and we'll move on to the traveler's guides next week uh, well thank you very much for that i should i always try and do this as a good a segue as any um patrons thank you uh this is one of my ways of thanking you is by giving you priority questions for these live streams um other things that patrons get is access to all of my audio um that i record here that includes i've done audio narrations of all of the pre-release chapters from the winds of winter and all of the videos that i release the audio narrations there i i put across onto patreon as well um so uh, if you're interested in that, please do go and check out the Patreon page. There's a link uh, down in the description uh, if you're interested at all in that. Um, but question from uh, Johnny Giants Bain is um, about the smaller houses. We often hear a lot about the lesser houses of other regions and would like your thoughts on the strength and loyalties of the Bannermen of House Baratheon. Given m many had split loyalties when Stannis and Renly went to war, I wonder if there are any awaiting their moment to step forward and usurp the power in the region when Stannis falls. Um, so, as I've already said, that there's um, uh, that there aren't any huge houses down in the Stormlands, but there are some significant ones. And... Um, the, uh, the it's very noticeable given the fact that the Brathians are relatively new they're not the dungeons who've been there for millennia uh, they're relatively new in the region they do appear not to have as much loyalty as perhaps some of the older ruling houses you will see that when robert baratheon uh, at the beginning of Robert's Rebellion, he went back to the Stormlands and the first thing he found out was that three of his houses re had rebelled against him and he had to crush a rebellion in his own area first before he could rally the, the rest of his uh, forces. 
Um, so that's there. Then you get the fact that you get Renly and Stannis, and the the forces were most of them went with Renly to be honest, but the forces were divided between the two of them. Um, and then after Renly died, they kind of shifted back. So a lot of them have been moving around their loyalties quite a lot. Um, are there any that are sort of waiting in the rings to rise up? I don't, I don't get that impression. We don't get told that all that much. Um, uh, there's, there's no particular hints that most of them have headed up uh, with, or most of the armies have headed up with Stannis to the north. So um, they, many of them are slowly dying in the, uh, the cold north up there. Um, I don't, and what's left are not shoot that's not hugely defended, which is how Fagon can come in and quite easily sweep through the the uh, the Stormlands because it's not particularly well uh, defended at the moment. Um, Henning J. Building on this says, since I always like to explore minor houses, my question is simply, how would you rank, let's say, the the five most important minor houses in the Stormlands after Baratheon, and why is my favourite minor house? Uh, the green turtle of Estamont not part of your list. Well, I'm happy to include Estamont in in the list. I think the, as I said, Swan is probably the most important uh, for the story. House Connington is is they um, basically they got um, they lost a lot when John Connington went, uh, but they're important back again for the story now. Then you get probably uh, another March or one of the Dondarians, perhaps, and Tarth. Um, Estamont, I would personally put just just under that. Tarth is, um, and I'll talk about Tarth in a moment actually, because this is they are an ancient ancient house and i think we sometimes forget about that we just think that they're just some some random house on an island somewhere but they are an ancient ancient house with again um this kind of very revealing um language used about them um theirs is more to do with the evening than the morning but like house dane the connection to the long night is very clearly there uh, okay, question um, from Catherine Furseth, uh, saying, Hi, Robert. Best almost spring wishes from the true north of Europe. The true north of Europe. Um, uh, wondering if you can speak a little about House Tarth. Ah, excellent. I, I planned this better than I thought I did. I'm going straight into House Tarth. Uh, it's history, and what about the title Evenstar given to their reigning lord? As heir to Tarth, I guess this means that Brienne at some point will be uh, Lady Evenstar of Tarth. Do you think this is just a curiosity of history or something that will actually have a meaning in the books? Okay, so the, the main residence of House Tarth is Evenfall, and the Lord of House Tarth is called the Evenstar. Now, this... Um, does resonate with the long night kind of language, obviously, with evening. Um, and when you start digging into House Tarth, you discover that actually they claim that they come from the dawn of days, not just the age of heroes, the dawn of days, and the title is the ancient one. So where does this fit in? Well, I'll do the the Brienne bit first before coming back to the house in a moment. Um, because Brienne, if she is to be the even star, which I think is quite possible because uh, her father is is old. We've told that we're told that um Tarth was successfully taken by the uh, Fagon's invasion as it came across. So I think there's a fair chance that her father will die in this story, that she will be the even star. There are a couple of allusions here, one of which the even star is the brightest star in the night sky, but also is often visible even before you get to the night time. So this is the kind of the feel of the, the light before it gets dark, the purity, the shining, bright, shining light which feels very Brienne, doesn't it? This kind of 
if we were to think in this story before we get to the long night, who who here is this bright shining light that in the story? Who's the the most true good character we have? Probably Brienne. Maybe you could claim Samuel Tarly, but probably Brienne. And um, so that is who and what she is is this bright shining star but also we get this and because george r. r martin is a huge tolkien scholar and a lover of tolkien he will know that even star is this is the name given to arwen who is the elf who aragorn loves and marries and she is known as the um the most beautiful woman and in the world she is there at the end of the elves time in middle earth and is there as this even star this this moment of shining beauty at the end of the elven time in middle earth and uh so that's the kind of feel that we've got going on there and i think george r, r. martin deliberately he plays with this idea of beauty with Brienne. She's called Brienne the beauty uh, in a mocking way. And I think he's trying to show us that she is beautiful. There is a beauty inside her as a person. She is beautiful. And so the fact that he is taking from his favorite story, the name of the most beautiful character, apparently, and taking it across into his story and giving it to somebody who everybody says is the opposite of being beautiful. I think this is him very, very, very deliberately, perhaps even heavy handedly showing us what true beauty it is, is in his mind. So that's the Brienne thing going on. I said I'd talk about the house as well because, um, and, and I feel like almost every live stream, I, I add a little bit to this, not a theory, but observation about islands, um, that we've got this succession of islands which seem to be connected back to the long night in some way, to the children of the forest in some way. We clearly have the Isle of Faces, which seems to be the heart of the Weirwood network. We've got Dragonstone, which seems to be where the um, Dragonglass mine is. We seem to have uh, Starfall, which is the place where Dawn is, the Sword of the Morning. Um, we also have Battle Isle, which is a place of some interest, which is where the High Tower is. And now we also have Tarth, which we we don't see much of, we don't hear much of, but the language is very connected in with the Long Night, the Even Star. This is where evening is, and this it's almost as if the first Lord of Tarth had this kind of Brienne feel to them had this kind of um, that before the long night kicked in they were this bright shining light so that is prop that is just another one of these islands that George R. R. Martin has as connections thematic conne connections in with the long night so um, as I say it's not a theory it's just an observation of something that George R. R. Martin's uh, doing maybe I will one day be able to turn it into a theory once I've uh, worked it up a bit but um, yeah the islands is definitely uh, something George R. R. Martin is playing with um, Caroline Schween saying I wonder if there will be any Baratheons left when all is said and done there's lots of foreshadowing for Shireen's death all of Robert's living children are bastards, and I believe Stannis will ultimately die as well. What do you think of the fate of Storm's End will be? Um, if there's a big shakedown coming either way, love to hear your thoughts. Big hello to Dan. Um, the fate of Storm's End... Well, I always have to say this, but there's a possibility that we don't know. George R. R. Martin is not going to tell us all of the ins and outs of everything that happens to every different part of his world at the end of the story. That's not how this is going to work. But um, it, the most likely, I think, is Edric Storm might end up with it. It's, it's, he's the person probably after Stannis. I agree, Stannis will the lesson with probably the best claim, and a king will be able to legitimize him. So Fagon will presumably be able to legitimize him and put him in there and maybe he stays there and that's 
that's probably the best bet I've got. I don't think that Storm's End is going to play a major role after the beginning part of the Winds of Winter. So who ends up there at the end of it is going to be just like one of those and uh, and a an appendices kind of moment um, rather than a central part of the story. Uh, Eric Fogg saying, does the Golden Company's arrival in the Stormlands register with Bloodraven? Before his uh, tree wizard days, he was obsessed with defeating the Golden Company and the Blackfire line. Yes, he will be aware of it because of the vast amount of weirwood trees down in the Stormlands. Um, and there is a weirwood tree in Storm's End. So yes, he will be aware of what is going on down there. I think it's worth pointing out, though, that... Um, although, yes, I'm sure that um, we have got a black fire descendant here in Fagon. Uh, I, Blood Raven's um, obsession with destroying the the line, the black fire line, was, I think, and this was part of my Blood Raven videos. If you're interested in wanting to go and check up all of this, because he was obsessed with where the line of the Prince of the Prince that was promised was going to be coming from. And in order to do that, he needed to clear out a huge amount of his own family tree. And when I say clear out a huge amount of his own family tree, that is obviously just he needed to make sure that lots of Targaryens died. And I count the, tar the Blackfires in that as well. They were people who had claims to the throne and he wanted very, very clearly to make sure that only a very clear bloodline that he had was manipulating stayed on the throne and therefore the prince that was promised who was going to come from that bloodline would be would have the sort of the magical bloodline that he wanted in it so that was what it was about at this point i don't think he cares that much i don't think it matters to him he's got john snow who was the culmination of all of that in that his own uh, personal eugenics program um blood raven i talk about him quite glowing a lot of the time but he's not good character um in the moral sense um he but he's got Jon Snow now so I don't think he really cares except in as much as what will in the south uh, what happens in the south will affect the ability of the continent as a whole to protect itself against the others that is the extent to which he will care about it I don't think he's thinking about um uh, getting rid of the blackfires and I think that um, getting Bran onto the throne at the end of it is going to happen in the books as well. So I, Fagon's just a, uh, an irrelevance to, to Blood Raven at the moment. Um, Eric Fogg, Ariane's Winds of Winter sample chapters have very interesting language that almost makes it sound like Aegon's crew was going to take her to Storm's End whether or not she wanted to go. What do you think that language means? Um, I didn't, Eric, apologies, I only got the, this question just before I was going... Uh, on air, so I haven't had a chance to reread that exact section. Um, but I think that it was it, it, from memory, um, this is more to do with showing that um, Fagon's not mucking about. He knows who he needs to, um, or at least his advisors know who he needs to be um, connected with. And Dawn is very, very important. Uh, as much as Doran Martell will be wanting to, once he discovers what's happened to Quentin, be wanting to throw in his lot behind Fagon, Fagon will also be actively seeking allies. So they don't want people like the Martells just randomly going around what they now consider to be their land. They want to be making contact with them. Um, uh, Mrs. Castle Dreams, you also asked about the uh, Gendry and Edric. I think I've covered that one off already at them. So uh, if you'll excuse me, I will uh, uh, assume that you I've answered that one for you. Um, Ariel Winchester saying, what state do you think Fagon will leave Storm's End in? Now, this is an interesting one. Um, I, I don't think he's going to uh, storm it, besiege it, bring it down. I think that... Um, he is going to gain it um, by negotiation and stealth. Um, he's not had enough time. You, people besiege it for a, a year or more and it doesn't fall. He's not going to suddenly turn up and magically get in there. Um, 
uh, in a way that people have failed for millennia. Um, so how is he going to do it? Well, I, th I think the um, the most likely answer, I mean, the, obviously we know that there is a way in through the boats, um, uh, which perhaps someone like John Connington will be aware of. Um, it's hard, hard to say. The, the, but the most likely way, I think, is the way that it has changed hands the last time or two. Um, we've got a small force who are currently there at the moment, protecting it, um, loyal to Stannis. Now, that small force have been holding out against the Tyrells, who Mace Tyrell's been there, as he did during Robert's Rebellion, sitting outside uh, Storm's End, besieging it, um, but really just having a, a nice picnic in a tent most days. Um, but the people who are holding it, the there's a guy there, pardon me, um, by the name of Elwood Meadows, who's the second in command. Now, he's important because um, he was the person who handed over Storm's End last time uh, to Stannis. Now, he was there supposedly loyal to, to Renly. Then came the the Shadow Babies killing off Renly and Courtney Penrose. And the person who gave over Storm's End was this guy called Elwood Meadows. Now, as a reward for that, he was then made Castellan of Storm's End, but was then demoted just a short while later. Um, and is then now again second in command. And I, I do wonder, we don't know huge amounts about this guy, but I do wonder, given that that's a very odd detail, um, and he has got a history of effectively handing over the keys, and we've seen a very similar thing happen with uh, Jamie, who was blazing his way through the Riverlands and gaining castles without actually having to attack them. Maybe this is going to be some sort of how it's going to work, is that this guy again, Elwood Meadows, is again going to hand it over um, and to the new Lord, because frankly, Stannis is gone. He's been gone for a long time. Uh, there's no indication of when, if ever, he's going to return. And so you might as well hand it over to what looks like an overwhelming force outside your gates. So were, what state will he leave it in? Exactly the same state he found it in, is my general view. Uh, Stephanie B. connected to this, saying, do you think that Fagon will ever learn his true identity? What would be the re repercussions be, and how would he react? Well, I don't think we, I don't think he will. I, I don't think he will at all. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me if the readers don't ever. Not fully. I, th I think we will get some new, very heavy hints that make it pretty obvious to anyone who's reading it um, or analysing it as they go through, um, that make it pretty clear that what wh who Fagon actually is. Uh, but I don't think we're going to get um, either of the people who know, being Illyrio or Varys, suddenly turning around and going, ah, actually, you know what? It's all a big lie. Uh, this guy isn't Aegon the Sixth. sixth. He's actually... You know, this uh, Blackfire descendant. I don't think we're going to get that. And I do, so I don't think we're ever going to go through Fagon having to uh, have a crisis of identity over it. So, um, uh, no, I, I don't think he will. Um, AK Channel TV saying, why didn't the Stormlands feel more loyalty to Stannis after he held Storm's End for so long? Usually such trauma creates bonds and loyalty. Um, yeah, so he held it in Robert's Rebellion for a long time, but it it was basically just him and a few other soldiers. They do, you don't need many people to hold Storm's End. It is very, very hard to take. So it was a very small number of people. And the Stormlands as a whole um, were a completely different matter. It was, they, they were just, it was just one castle on the sea 
over the top of the cliffs and that was it that was the focus of what was going on um robert baratheon had taken his army um and had worked his way right across through the reach up into the riverlands by the time he actually met up with ned's army and the whole idea was he was going to bring his army up and meet it with ned's army further north his army had pretty much gone by that point he'd like burned through it all um there were a few uh, left afterwards but um he was definitely on his in the battle of the bells then he was definitely on his own there um with no army in sight so uh, this the the stormlands as a whole were not they they were probably just a matter of you know robert robert baratheon's as, as charged off and then the soldiers are just to uh, who got injured in battle slowly slink home over time and then well what do you know now the siege has been lifted that's the field so it's not that the people of the stormlands felt any particular um uh, debt owed to stannis yes he kept that uh, storm's end um from uh the tyrells but if it had fallen would it have actually made any difference to anything in the war not even slightly if it if it had fallen a, a few weeks earlier or something then uh mace tyrell would have sat in uh storm's end he would have been having his picnics in in the castle rather than outside it and then ned would have come to storm's end and mace would have walked out straight away and headed off back home that it would have made absolutely no difference to to the way that the um uh the the war went and added to which i think if uh it, given the history of storms End, nobody expected him to lose it because you can't nobody had ever um uh, taken storms end so if if stannis was there just well of course you going to keep it it's the castle that can't be breached so um that's probably the feeling um that's there um mm -mm -mm. reflective rambling thank you so much picking up from uh robinson 88 why is Littlefinger obsessed with baratheon tapestries in a feast for crows what could be important about them for him to send a message to cersei and ask for them um I think this is a really good question. Um, I, I don't know the extent to which he's obsessed with them. I, um, I'm going to make this my one that I come back to next time, um, uh, if that's okay. Uh, thank you for Robinson. Uh, you picked a good question and also reflective rambling. Um, I, I have been asked this about this before, um, and, and I could come up with some bog standard answer i don't think you want a bog standard answer I mean, i'm, I'm going to give this one a bit of thought um little fingers always operating plans within plans so um that there, there is a good reason i feel sure i will come back to this one next time andrew k uh talk about fagon saying a lot of it points to illyrio's child his wife had the valyrian looks and their departure or separation seems much more emotional than as a caretaker for a throne claimant yeah absolutely i agree that that seems to make a huge amount of sense. Um, uh, Sasak saying, I've told them to look up Radio Westeros's ideas on it, as well as Lady Gwynne's blog, and in the episodes, I'll always, um, always recommend looking up what Lady Gwynne says and Radio Westeros. Um, uh, so, yeah, so Carl Carson, yeah, the tapestries of pictures of various hunting or uh, myth themes, something like that, I can't remember exactly. So they are... Um, the that the history of these um i will happily do now is that the in the the great hall at king's landing then under the um uh, under the targaryens there were dragon heads the the old dragon skulls that they used to line the walls there when robert baratheon came in obviously he didn't want them so they all got moved down into the cellars down down below and Tyrion went to see them Arya went to see them uh, they're there but they're out of the way and in their place Robert Baratheon has put up these huge 
tapestries of hunting scenes and the like. Now, um, Cersei, obviously, when Robert Baratheon's gone, Cersei didn't really like them either, so she's probably quite happy to be getting rid of them too. It, so there's, there's a matter of interior decoration that's going on here. But also there's a sort of the um, uh, who owns the, the thing from the rightful king. The, the the decor of the rightful king, uh, but as I say, I'm I'm going to come up with a, a a better theory than that um, next time. But that's the the background to it. Uh, Neil Brido, uh, thank you so much. Saying I love what you do. Keep it up. Thank you very much. Um, question from. Uh, Oh, well, I'm moving into some more random questions now from my patrons. So, uh, so Diego Godoy saying, uh, I will use this. Hola, Robert. Hola. Uh, I will use this Stormlands live stream to ask this. Have you finished your Robert's Rebellion series of videos? I've been meaning to re-watch them as they are my favorite of your series of videos and what got me into Indie Geek back in the day. Uh, yes, I have. It took me a long time. Uh, but I've worked my way through. So my Robert's Rebellion se series of videos, for those who don't know, I, just breaking it down, the entire rebellion, what caused it, what happened at each different stage, what was going on behind the scenes, what happened at the Tower of Joy, all of that kind of stuff. If you're interested, there is a playlist down somewhere in the um, in the channel page. So uh, yes, do that. Um, what I'm now embarking on in terms of a series... Uh, in the world of A Song of Ice and Fire is going through the Dance of the Dragons. So I've started out, uh, I released last week, I think, maybe the week before, um, Dance of the Dragons, an overview. What was the, uh, you know, 10, I think it's about 13 minutes worth of just, if you haven't got time to read all of Fire and Blood, but people keep on talking about the Dance of the Dragons, what was it? Who who was on the sides? Who won? That kind of thing. So if you want that kind of overview there, and I'm going to follow that up by working through the Dance of the Dragons in a lot more detail. So coming up possibly tomorrow, um, I will be doing a video on, uh, might be Monday, I'll see, uh, a video coming out on what was the what was the cause of the Dance of Dragons? Was this just a succession crisis? Was there more to it than that? What was the actual cause of the Dance of the Dragons? And then I'm going to work my way through it. Who lined up on each side? Um, what what happened at the different parts of the, the dance? Uh, how did it all end? That kind of stuff. So I don't know quite how many videos that is, but that's the plan for the next, um, next one that's coming up. Um, uh, and, and this does actually... Remind me, this is completely random. But if you're if you're watching this far into the live stream, I'm going to assume that you're um, you, you like the kind of things that I produce. So I'd be very interested in your view. I'm probably going to set up in Deep Geek as a, a podcast to run alongside this. So I do the YouTube things and release the same content as audio over on as a podcast. I know some people prefer uh, accessing it that way, so I thought I'd just make it a little bit easier. Um, so my question is, if I did do that, and I don't know, I'm always very slow in doing these things, so, you know, don't, don't hold your breath on it, but that's part of the plan. Um, if I did do that, would you want me to release everything that I've done so far? Would you like uh, just be just the live streams or how about the uh doing the the videos uh, the audio for the the sort of the more scripted videos as well what do you think what do you think you would like so if you if you're a, if you're a fan of the stuff that i do if you're interested in it and if you think you would consume it over on as a podcast um then how do you think that might work happy for any thoughts down in the comments below if you're if you're in the chat um uh, then I, I will try and have a look at it, but it comes very quickly, so probably best to put the comments down, in, down below the video afterwards. Um, anyway, completely random, but I would love to hear your thoughts. Um, and patrons, go and tell me on Patreon. Uh, that's uh, another good way for me to see it. Um, question from... Uh, oh, actually, I didn't see. This is another one of those ones I didn't cut and paste the name across. So, uh, apologies, uh, a patron whose name I do not know. Saying hi, Robert. In relation to the Winds of Winter, can we predict to see either a Hodor POV epilogue chapter or at least one Hodor POV in the book? 
in a twist of events, I have a feeling we may see Bran killing Mira or um, uh, having intercourse with her by walking into Hodor which Mira would probably do unwillingly. I'm not sure if you've read this novel, but um, of Mice and the Of Mice and Men scene where, spoilers for Of Mice and Men, I think we're probably beyond that now, but where Lenny kills Curly's wife springs to mind. Of course, this is theoretical, but the hold the door scenario may actually be a redemption on part of Hodor or Bran for that matter. What are your thoughts on this? Um, uh, lot, lots of different things. So lots of different things. So the first I was actually uh, this. The first thing this made me think of was uh, George R. R. Martin a few years ago did an April Fool's joke um, where he said he's he was currently writing a chapter from uh, Hodor's and would we like a picture of it? Uh, Hodor POV chapter. And it was literally just an entire page of him having typed Hodor, 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 Hodor. Um, it made me giggle at the time. Um, I don't think we're going to see a Hodor POV. George R. R. Martin has been reasonably clear that, um, and he does change his mind on this uh, quite a lot, um, but uh, we're not going to have any new major POV characters. We will see, as we have done already, we will see things through uh, Hodor when Bran is walking into him, but that no distinct Hodor POV chapter i don't think so that's there i don't think we're going to be seeing anything with bran forcing himself on mirror through hodor i don't think yes george R. R. martin does write some pretty dark stuff at times and bran is getting to be a pretty dark character but i don't think that's where we're going with it um the hold the door scenario is an interesting one because we've had recently a bit of an update on this from George R. R. Martin. It was in A uh, Fire Cannot Kill a Dragon. The This is a behind-the-scenes book. Um, the author the author's name escapes me at the moment, but I would recommend it if you're interested in uh, the TV show in particular. There's interviews with um, George R. R. Martin, the showrunners, actors lots of other people who are involved in it there's lots of behind the scenes stuff but what i found interesting was the what we can draw from that for the books and george r, r. martin talks about hold the door as a moment that was in the tv show and he specifically addressed whether this is going to be in the books and he's already said that yes we're going to have uh the hold or hold the door moment in the books. But what he said here was quite um, um, an important nuance, I think, in that he said they interpreted it as very literally hold the door. So that's what we had Hodor holding a door, literally holding a door. Uh, what we will, uh, what we'll have in the books is less literal than that more in the sense that um, you might say to someone um, in a war or a battle situation, hold the corridor, hold this area. Uh, and that is what Hodor is going to be doing. He is going to be holding the door, therefore fighting against the people who are coming and allowing Bran to escape. So that is the kind of slight nuance that we're going to be getting on there. Bran is again going to be uh, walking into him at this point. We've had lots of foreshadowing on this that he has been, uh, Bran wants to be fighting. He is going into Hodor and he practices fighting with Hodor. So we're going to see this happen again. Um, and so that that's the way it goes. I mean, I've, I've gone off on a tangent on this before uh, that... Um, I mean, I don't think this is tinfoil. I think this is just following the, the logic of this. If if Hodor is holding the door against the others in some way, then he has to have a weapon that will allow him to do that. Now, there are... I mean, is he going to use dragon glass? Or is perhaps he going to be using what we know or are pretty sure is there, which is a Valyrian steel sword? It's it's possible and that's Dark Sister, incidentally, which was Blood Raven's sword, which is almost certainly lying around somewhere there. So um, 
Hodor will have his way. It's not. This is going to be a dark moment. This is not going to be a moment of redemption. I think for for Bran, this is going to be a dark moment. The culmination of him uh, taking over Hodor's body and using it as he wishes is for Hodor to die because Bran is using him to be saving his own life. Um, question from Johanna or Johanna Hepburn saying, um, when we finally have a release date for the Winds of Winter, would you consider doing some videos to summarize the story so far? I always find your summaries informative and easy to follow. I knew I'd find it helpful. Um, yes, yeah, thank you. I mean, it did. It, it's something I'm considering. I, I've thought a bit and I've asked before about what, what people might want when the Winter Winter does come out. Um, the build up to that, I think, yes, some people will probably want some sort of primers on where are we at. And, and I will do something like that. I don't know exactly how that is. Um, maybe it's like an overview of each book or maybe it's an overview of different characters journeys i've thought about that i think that's um pardon me i think that's probably the most likely thing that i would do i like this idea of running through a character's narrative rather than just sort of the time thing for everyone so we see all of daenerys's uh, journey it's actually it's interesting if if you ever want if you're addicted to reading the books and i know some of you are it's a it's an interesting different way to do it, it rather than reading it through traditionally picking a character and then reading all of their um uh, pov chapters one after the other in in order in that book so you read all the way through aya rather than worrying about how she fits in with other things which is uh, it gives you a slightly more focused view in on it um uh turbo no it's it's half past midnight in england right now uh so, <laughs> so that's apologies if i was if i was yawning um uh shasha saying or in fact uh see gashiola saying what do you think will be the fate of patch face i've talked about this with i had um um amanda uh, disputed lands on a while ago and we talked about patch face so if you're interested in the detail then do go over there i think the short version is that patch face um he is um very very closely associated with shireen uh, and he will want to protect her and i think what we will see is that when shireen is taken and tied and burned melisandre will see this as an opportunity to also get rid of patchface who she does not trust and she fears in some way and patchface will probably also try his very very best to prevent shireen from being killed so I cannot see him surviving that. Melisandre will survive that. I cannot see Patchface surviving that. So he will die trying to prevent Shireen from being burned to death. Um, Shah Shah, I'm currently still uh, rereading The Winds of uh, the World of Ice and Fire, and just now in the Stormlands. So I just read about Oris's hand again. I can't help but see the echo in Jamie. However, I don't really understand it. There seems to be no other connection between them. Not in family, not in character. What is George R. R. Martin trying to set up? Uh, or is it just a coincidence? Um, I'm also seeing quite a tangled connection to Davos, as Oris has a son of that name who always uh, said that Oris, on his way back from the war, died content, smiling at the rotting hands and feet that dangled in his tent like a string of onions. Is there something to explore here as well? Yes, I think there is something to explore. So for those who don't know, Oris Baratheon, this is the first um, uh, the first Baratheon king, and he lost a hand in battle and against the Dornish. And from that moment on, he was then obsessed with um, gaining his vengeance on the Dornish, and eventually he did. He was very old and near death, but he went in um, to Dawn and he got his vengeance and he cut off hands off of the, the, the people he wanted vengeance against. So is there a connection here to Jamie, who obviously also has lost his hand? Yes, but I think that this is an opposite that George R. R. Martin is trying to show us. What happens when you lose your hand, he is saying, is you change. 
you, who you are changes and you start you start seeing the world in different ways. What we have with Oris Baratheon is that he, from that moment on, we're told he started to, um, did I might have even written down the, the words we're told, uh, no, but he was changed and he wanted revenge. Um, uh, and that was what obsessed him, is that he, he shriveled in on himself and he just was focused in on this one thing. Jamie loses his hand and suddenly he's changed but he's changed for the better and he's he's moving away from the thing which kept him shackled down and now is starting to see the bigger picture. So what George R. Martin is trying to do is show us this is how some people would react to it. This is how Jamie is reacting to it. And so that is the uh, the sort of the link there. And the, the Davos thing, um, uh, yes, this is probably slightly more tenuous. So whether this is intent on George R. Martin's part or not, I do not know. But Davos has also um, lost uh, not his whole hand, but obviously his fingers. So um, that means that gives us another opportunity to see what, how does someone react to this? And we've got Oris Baratheon who, relax, uh, who reacts by getting angry, getting vengeful, getting focused and turning to his darker side. Jamie, who reacts by reevaluating his life, trying to recover his sense of honour and moving more towards the lighter side of his life and character. Davos, personally, I would argue, doesn't make a difference. He's the same person he was before and after. So Davos is sort of in the middle, and then we get these two extremes. So that would be my own take of what George R. Martin there is sort of working at at a, a slightly more thematic level. Um, uh, and Shasha also saying, please give a nod to the best deadpan annotation line in all of literature, Rogar Baratheon never wed again. Um yeah, so this, for those who don't know, it is a very good deadpan line. Um, for those who don't know, so Rhaegar Baratheon was married to Alyssa Targaryen, who was the mother of Jaehaerys and Alison. Um, and he he was pretty much a typical a Baratheon in many ways, um, uh, and quite a quite a formidable figure in his time. But anyway, he ends up going back, having tried to sort of um, uh, effectively being regent and trying to manipulate events to get exactly what he wanted. Um, he and Alyssa end up back in Storm's End. Uh, Jaehaerys is definitely in power. And um, Alyssa has children carrying on into her late middle age i think she's well into her 40s um which at the time was almost unheard of as still being having children um and they're left with this situation where the maester says to him uh to rogar baratheon he says basically you have to choose do you do you save the baby um you, your wife is probably going to die but you know do you want me to make sure that the baby survives? Um, and he grudgingly has to do do this, and he says, yeah, make the baby alive. Uh, make sure that the baby survives, and his wife, Alyssa, um, dies. Um, what happens then is that the Targaryens, they, they have been a little bit uh, suspicious of him, uh, for quite some time, and Raina Targaryen comes in, and she basically sits him down and says, let me be completely clear to you right now, um, if you ever mistreat the children that she had, uh, if you ever do step out of line in any way, shape, or form, if you ever marry any other person ever again, I'm going to come down here and I'm going to burn you and your family and your castle to the ground. And then we just get this deadpan line, Rogar Baratheon never married again. And it's just like, of course you wouldn't. He's he he realizes you don't mess with the Targaryens. It, that wasn't wasn't really it, it was a horrendous place for him to, to be in, but uh that's um uh 
Uh, he probably deserved it as well. But anyway, it, it's a good line. Um, last question from my patrons. So now's a good time um, to uh, drop any more questions into the chat. Um, I will try and pick up as many questions in the chat as I can. Kai Johnson, a question that is unrelated to this live stream topic, but I've been thinking that Bran may be the one who provides a passage or gateway for the White Walkers as um, and Whites to be able to pass through the wall. If Bran is marked by a White Walker, as soon as he travels through the wall, the preventative magic stopping the Whites getting through may break. Um, allowing them to travel safely to the south. Alternatively, the wall may actually come down as a result of this due to Bran unknowingly tricking the magic. Could this theory be possible? I would much prefer that than an ice dragon melting a portion of it. Uh, yes, so um, there's a lot to unpack here. The big question is how do the others get south of the wall, as surely they must. Now, uh, I mentioned a little bit ago about the book um, Fire Cannot Kill a Dragon. Now, this, um, as well as talking about the Hodor thing, there was also a really interesting bit from the showrunners, which, um, and I know that that automatically makes a lot of people sort of um, go, oh, well, we can't believe what they say, but... I think when we can read between the lines of what they're saying in the things that they claim credit for having invented, that means that there has to be a reason for it because that does not happen in the books because George R. R. Martin would have told them. So they talk very openly about the fact that beyond the wall episode when the, um, uh, the Night King gets a dragon um they invented that uh, because they needed a way for the uh, the white walkers to get down get rid of the wall the fact that they invented all of that tells me that that's not how it happens in the books it's very clear from what they said that is not how it happens. so a dragon breathing fire or ice or whatever onto the wall is not how it's going to happen in the books. They said they had to come up with a way to, with a powerful new thing that they hadn't already got in the story, which tells me that whatever it was that, that happens in the books, they did not introduce into the story for what the, the TV show for whatever reason. So that leaves us with a few different options. Maybe it's something like you say, they did actually introduce this as a concept in the show that Bran got marked, and that mark seemed to allow uh, the White Walkers to get in past the barrier that Blood Raven appears to, or the Children of the Forest had set up around Blood Raven's cave. So uh, that, I think, is the idea that you're talking about here kai about um if bran gets marked and then he goes south of the wall then if that's the same sort of magic then that might mean that the white walkers can come through as well i, mean, I like that idea i don't think that that is going to be what it is because the showrunners would have done that um because they introduced the subject so they didn't need to look for another way to bring down the wall um which means that there must be some other thing the Horn of Winter is possible. They didn't mention that at all. Um, going through the cave systems is possible. They didn't really mention that at all either. Go coming through the Night Fort is also possible. They didn't really talk about that with the Black Gate and all the things there. So that's possible. There are a lot of different possibilities that they've got, but it is not going to be uh, a dragon blowing down the wall. Um, Okay, uh, let's have a quick flick through. Um, uh, Turbo uh, Indeed Geek, will Bitcoin hit 60K this week? I am not your financial advisor, so apologies. I'm going to uh, pass on that one. Um, uh, Carl Karsnark saying, our Robert is a geek in the streets and a Baratheon in the sheets, it is known. Uh, okay, emergency critic hologram. Hi, Robert. What were the Lannisters planning for the Stormlands after the war? Technically, it's supposed to be Joffrey's homeland, but it rose against him. Who did they plan to rule Storm's End? Um, a pass on that one. I don't think uh, we really 
got to that, um, to the best of my knowledge. That they did seem to be putting their people in places, though. Uh, that seems to be their aim. So they've been putting Lannisters right across the Riverlands. Um, it is mostly when they controlled an area that they um, started dropping uh, people um in uh, fodder for foreshadowing, how many people do you think John Con will infect with the grayscale by the end of wins, knowingly or unknowingly? Um, it may be partly him. There may also be a ship coming from abroad. We've heard rumours of uh, this across Essos. Um, but yes, I I personally think that by the end of wins, then uh, we will be seeing an outbreak of. Uh, grayscale of some kind. Gray, the, there are different types of diseases around grayscale. We we use grayscale often as just a, a a short way of saying it. But there will be an outbreak that by the first part of a dream of spring will be quite widespread. So yes, that's definitely going to be there. Um, uh, Adam Alolo saying, are we going to have more Lord of the Rings content? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I've got various um, Lord of the Rings things coming up. Uh, one that I've just started working on now is why wasn't Aragorn already king? So if you're interested in that, um, then uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, uh, Beres Aurelius talking about bread. Bread is great. Um, can't keep away from the stuff. Uh, exactly. Um, and I think that's me caught up and let's just have a quick check. Um, if there's any more, no, I think I will be, uh, Zach Berger, just last question. Uh, do you think Blood Raven, the Blood Raven tree will be destroyed in the books or uh, will he survive in some form in the Weirwood Network? I think Blood Raven will is already largely uploaded into the Weirwood network, so to speak. Um, he's completely connected. His physical body will not move from where it is. It is he's got tree roots coming through his eye socket and things like that. He is physically not moving from where he is. So, um, but who he is and his memories are being passed up into that, and Bran will take on uh, the. A, a more roving role going south. So that is that's Blood Raven's fate. He's already in the Weirwood network, so to speak. Okay, uh, and with that, I'm going to start pulling this to a close. Uh, next week, I'll be back. I will do um, uh, probably something. I can't. I don't know what I'm going to call it yet, but I will cover King's Landing and uh, Dragonstone and that kind of the Crownlands kind of area. Uh, so that's what we're going to be doing next time. Um, if you are interested in uh, this uh, live streams like this, there is a link appearing up here uh, a bit afterwards. And if you're at all interested in supporting the channel, getting access to some stuff, uh, then there's going to be a link appearing up here to my Patreon page. Um, and if you want to talk to me about podcasts, put a comment down in the uh, the um, comment section down below. Okay, that's it. Take care, everyone, and I will see you again soon.